maintain our our net connection, it's gonna be a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Aaron had really Aaron had really decent internet speed over there. It's Neil, you're the weak link. You're well, the weak internet link. That just goes to show you that some places are more developed than others. Yeah. Whatever you may think of them. I, I bet you would have better internet, surprisingly, in Indonesia than New Zealand, though. New Zealand had, like, the worst internet of all time. Not to insult really? anyone from New Zealand. I love New Zealand. Much love. Okay. <laughs> all right, so why don't we get started? It's about 11. Um, usually we wait for a few people to trickle in, but we might as well get rolling. So I'm Raleigh Latham. I'm the co-host with Neil Spackman of the Sustainable Design Masterclass. Uh, last week we did a really cool webinar on how to build cultural trust uh, with among the people that you work with on regenerative projects and we brought Aaron Elton on because he's got a really cool follow-up webinar on rebuilding regenerative industries in Uganda and in his specific way he's doing that uh, with Moringa. Um, I'm going to let Neil explain a little bit further because i got to deal with some back-end technical stuff, but we're going to get started really soon. I think you're all going to really enjoy this webinar because it's Aaron's got an incredible model for uh, alleviating farmers in poverty through regenerative agriculture. I think you're going to get a lot out of it. So, Neil, why don't you take it away? All right. Welcome, everybody, to Sustainable Design Masterclass. Uh, Aaron and I came across each other maybe six months ago, and I remember clicking through some of his photos, and I friended him kind of out of the blue, and we started to talk a bit, and I said, this guy is doing a lot of stuff similar to what I'm doing, uh, but they're further ahead in the game and in a little bit of an easier climate ecologically, and so I'm, I'm really, really interested in hearing what Aaron's story is. Um, and I'm really happy that all of you are here because I think we're going to learn a lot and be able to see. All right, so now we are recording, and uh, we're going to turn this over to Aaron. Uh, thank you, everybody, for your time. Thank you for coming. And this is Aaron Elton on regenerative community building and moringa farming in Uganda. Yeah, thanks a lot, Neil. And uh, hello to everybody out there. Um, just a quick question as we get started. It's asking me to show my screen. Do you guys want me to do that now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Go for it. Okay, we're going to show my screen and then I'll hit play here. Uh, and you can still see me and you're seeing my slide presentation, right? Yep, I can see it. We'll, we'll ask. It's going back to I'm the beginning. I'm that guy on a horse. Okay, now, can you see... Somebody eating a lot of Moringa. Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right, thank you so much for having me. Um, I've, I've put together this presentation specifically for this uh, opportunity. And um, albeit that we're going to talk a lot about Moringa, I'm going to try to fill you up with as much Moringa information as I possibly can. Um, but I'm also going to give you a little bit of background and context. So, um, yeah, my name is Aaron Elton, and I'll just jump into it. So. <clears throat> I've been in Uganda for 11 years, and I, I, I wanted to uh, start this presentation by basically asking the question, why should we build a company that has the potential to hire jobless youth and replenish the health of people on the planet in the same stroke? And that's really something that is uh, it's, it's in the core of my work. Is, is, is I'm really dedicated to building corporate structures that actually work for people and the planet in the same stroke and obviously permaculture design is one of the most important and powerful tools that we utilize to do that. Um, so these are some of the topics that we're going to go over uh, over the next uh, 45 minutes. I'll try to keep it as brief as possible and uh, guys warn me if I talk too quickly because um, I tend to do that. But um, So I'm just going to give you a quick personal history of my life in Uganda and a lot of that has to do with the 10 years of planning of how to take over the world but actually just build a better one. And um, the reason why I brought, uh, you know, the brain in here, this image of the, 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 the Animaniacs character, is because I really think that in order for people like Neil and myself and other individuals who are out there pioneering new systems, we really do have to have that sort of diehard attitude of never giving up, of retrying things over and over and over again, because 
the fact is is that sustainable design and sustainable business is the right way to go, but it does take a very serious dedication because as you know, the world we're living in is, is uh, very much unsustainable in many ways. <clears throat> so we'll go into that. Then we're going to move on to uh, building capacity towards what? Uh, this is my, my life uh, over the last 10 years has been building the capacity towards building Priceless Farms 1. Uh, this is the company that I now uh, am a, a director and a co-shareholder with. I have uh, some, some a very long story there, but I'll, I'll condense it. So we'll talk about that. It's a major 250-acre uh, uh, installation that we're doing. <clears throat> and then we're going to move into a focus on Moringa and uh, the incredible benefits that Moringa has and the different qualities and then also some of the markets. And there's some new discoveries that I've been coming up with, two uh, recent discoveries this year that have really just blown my mind that I'm going to share with you guys. Uh, and then to, to finish off, I'm going to talk about catalyst projects which are under development. Now when I say catalyst projects, we're talking about massive money generating projects that are, fall under that category of sustainability. So good for people, good for the planet. So let's jump into it. Um, so my first uh, experience in Uganda started in 2005. Uh, I came out of cinematography school out of Western Canada and I wanted to make uh, music videos and documentaries with indigenous African musicians. And uh, we had a lot of different partnerships at that time. And for four years, I produced a lot of different documentary and music videos with musicians that were rapping and singing about culturally relevant issues to them in their, in their cu cultural context. And that was an amazing experience for me because uh, obviously as a young, you know, 21-year-old middle-class Canadian who had just come out of, uh, you know, college, uh, coming into the heart of East Africa, into Uganda, and filming in ghettos and so, so on, I, my whole world was, was turned upside down, which is a very beneficial thing when you're, when you're looking to improve yourself. And, and, and ultimately, I discovered that I wanted to also improve the world. And so during that time, I was able to meet such a wide range of the cultural, uh, of the, uh, a wide range of the culture and a wide range of the, the population and see all the different issues. We were making music videos about child rape, about AIDS stigmatization, about um, post-war life in displaced people's camps in Gulu. Um, and, and I was doing this for three years. This, this fellow in this image, in this slide, um, was part of a Muslim Christian, uh, uh, what do they say, it's like a seminar where the Muslims and the Christians all get together and they debate whether the Quran is better than the Bible or the Bible is better than the Quran and which system is best and it was a, it was a very interesting thing so I'm just I'm putting these slides in here to show you that you know I really had a very in-depth experience for three years and uh, the whole project that I was working on was aimed at um, basically creating teen centers because in, in Western Canada I was a lifeguard and I worked with teen centers as a municipal employee for West Vancouver and Bowen Island and um, we, we realized that there, there was nothing really for the youth in terms of like after school activities and, and in lieu of school activities because a lot of the kids in these communities don't even go to school. And so these are some of the friends that I was developing and some of the, uh, one of the first houses that we actually rented to turn into a Babubuka center and these were some of the kids we were working with. So um, after about three years I ran out of money <clears throat> and I ran out of energy and I realized that what I was doing wasn't enough. And uh, <clears throat> this is when the National Environment uh, Management Authority report from, from the Ugandan government came out in 2008. And you can see here uh, the highlighted issue. Uh, this is really where my career took a turn into sustainable design science. And it was literally this, this very article here that you're seeing. And so I'll just go over it with you. Um, but the, the first paragraph that's highlighted there is basically saying this is the, the third fastest uh, population growth rate in the world which is massively reducing the, uh, the, 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 the small amount of resources. It's a small country. Uganda's population is doubling every 18 years. Right now they have the same population as Canada. They're at about 36 million roughly, but uh, by 2050 they'll have about 100 million people here. And then the second uh, paragraph there is showing that if, if the rate of deforestation continues, they'll have no forested land by 2050. Now, that hit me like a ton of bricks because I was obviously looking for solutions. You know, I've got a sort of a background. I love, um, <clears throat> you know, Sherlock Holmes and uh, all these different inspirational characters throughout the um, storybook history that a lot of Western children receive. 
And I realized, you know, if, if this is true, if, if they lose all their forests, I had enough of a frame of mind to realize that that meant that this country was going to collapse. And this is a very sub this is a very tropical country. All the earliest explorers explained that Uganda was um, basically, um, they call it the Pearl of Africa, but the earliest explorers literally said, we have found the Garden of Eden. And just a quick context there, uh, Uganda has all five of the major bioregions bio that are represented by the continent of Africa, and it's the only country with all five, the top five. And uh, the biodiversity here is immense. And of course, as we know, 80% of that bi land-based land biodiversity is in the forests. So if the only country in Africa which has all five of the bioregions represented within its borders loses its forests, then that is a catastrophic event, not only for the continent, not only for the world, but in particular for East Africa as a, as a conglomerate. And at that time, I basically predicted that mm, this should become sort of a, a hub for the Western interest in Africa. And sure enough, uh, three years after I made that prediction, the UN decided to move its uh, military head of operations for the continent into Entebbe, Uganda, which is where the international uh, airport is. So I started seeing how this was, this was uh, becoming a major concern globally. So I decided I'm going to move into that. And um, so here's a nice quote that I really like casting out there. This is a short version. The control man has secured over nature has far outrun his control over himself. And uh, if you sit and think about that for a while, you really realize the state of affairs that we're in. And uh, these are the types of messages that I was receiving as I was doing my research that led me towards... Uh, writing a paper. I wrote a paper called Our Mother Earth Village, which was the culmination of all my different experiences working in East Africa with all these different uh, different people and seeing all of this different suffering, different forms of suffering. And uh, in, in that paper, this is before I came across permaculture design, I said a sustainable world culture would see the, world fa the word family as inclusive rather than exclusive uh, and that laws should reflect natural laws for our common good and, and that we can uh, design a new way of living that is healthy and non-destructive. And so that was my young mind trying to write sort of like a personal thesis about how we can solve the world's problems. Now I took that back to Canada and the first person I took it to, a friend of mine named Sobe Wing, a very a very amazing individual who I had a lot of respect for in the, in the Vancouver uh, consciousness scene. And he read the first two pages and he said, Aaron, this is permaculture design. And he, he, he literally pulled the permaculture designer's manual out from under his bed. Now, I was at a point in my life where I knew I needed to change directions because I, 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 I was doing everything um, just, you know, uh, pro bono or, or as a volunteer, if you will. And, um, and I had a lot of success with the media, but I realized that what I was doing was unsustainable on so many levels, emotional, mental, and, and financial uh, as, as the bedrock. And so when I picked up the designer's manual for the first time and I started reading it, I didn't put it down. And um, for like a month or two, I read the whole thing. And then later that year, I was um, <clears throat> introduced to Jesse Lemieux, who was returning from Bill Mollison and Jeff Lawton. Uh, he had spent two years studying with them in, uh, in Australia. And I was, uh, went and I immediately shook his hand at the end of his presentation and I said, I'm signing up for your course. And in 2009, I was certified. And in 2010, I took my ideas of building a very powerful, a very uh, important company, and I went back to um, Uganda. So this is me uh, sitting in a room with a bunch of evangelical people um, in a in in a church. This was the first training I did in 2010 when I came back from from Canada. And uh, actually, it was a it was a really hard time because. Albeit that the students who you see in this picture here were really, really loving the information. I mean, the permaculture information is really very easy to get across to young African uh, uh, folk in the sense that it, it reminds them about their true self. And, the, and, and I think that's something that everybody experiences when they take their permaculture design course. And so shortly after this photo was taken, I think it was about a day or two later, we had set up a program where all that land that you see behind us there was going to turn into a permaculture garden. And then there was this one woman in the church who started making a fuss because she saw the snake on the front of the permaculture manual there that you're seeing in the top right corner or the top left corner of the, of the image. And they basically said, no, uh, they, they had a meeting. They found out that I wasn't a staunch Christian like them, and I certainly wasn't a born again who wanted to ra run around and speak in tongues with them. And uh, they told me that nothing should be taught in church except for the Bible. 
And so I kind of said, all right, it's, it's, it's your church, it's your thing. So I left and I went on and uh, I just wanted to put this slide there. And it, it's, uh, it's a really interesting one because it speaks to that situation. And this is a global consciousness issue, this whole hardcore religious mindset that really blocks um, creative thinking from coming in. And it's, it says here that uh, there's nothing so well known as that we should not expect something from nothing, <clears throat> but we all do it and call it hope, or we all do expect not something from nothing, and we call it hope. And I really think that uh, that was sort of a, a major hurdle, and it's still a major hurdle that I have to overcome with my students to get them to think scientifically, because the religious evangelical sort of movement, not only around the world, but particularly in Africa, has been so uh, deeply ingrained that um, getting people to think on a logical basis is one of the most important aspects of teaching. So I decided to approach the universities. This is one of the first groups of university students. These are all environmental studies students that we set up a nursery with and I taught them permaculture design. This is one of the gardens behind the, behind the university. They got one acre of land. We went in there and we did a full-on permaculture training with them and as you can see the energy is there. And a lot of these students that you see in this image, this is going back to 2010, they're still doing permaculture in various different ways and their careers are going quite well as a matter of fact because most of the students in this country who decide to get involved with land-based projects are doing well because Uganda is very land rich and uh, resource rich. Um, later in 2010, coming into 2011, I was blessed. I, I met some uh, steel executives at a local bar uh, through some friends and um, we started talking and they asked me, they said, you sound like a passionate guy, it sounds like what you're doing is amazing, we're looking for a CSR program and at that time they were revamping their branding so they wanted corporate social responsibility program and they built this school for me and uh, they gave me one acre, a one acre parcel of land, approximately one acre parcel of land which was actually a garbage dump, it was, uh, <clears throat> it was pure subsoil on half the site, the lower half of the site was just grass and we went in and we, we installed the first uh, inner city uh, permaculture uh, academy or school and we, you know, we, I had to rebrand it specifically for the company so we call it the Forever Forestry uh, Club or the Roofings Forever Forestry Guild, Roofings being the name of the steel factory. So this was a this was a major turning point in my career being back one year after doing all these groundwork trainings to, to find the right people to work with then all of a sudden I'm working with the, the region's largest steel corporation at the time that I joined them they controlled 63 percent of the um, of the steel industry East Africa wide so they're a megalithic company to work with and it was a big win and um, so that facility this is now four years later this is an image four years after we did the install so the tree that you see in the background here is uh, we call it Lyra. Uh, I don't know the technical name myself. It's actually in the photo, but um, not so good with names. But that tree there was a, a, a three inch seedling just four years ago. And uh, that entire site that we're standing on had no trees whatsoever. And so you can see the rate of growth that the permaculture system has, particularly in the, in the tropical context in Uganda. And uh, the class you're seeing here is a third party organization called Malika Honey who are continuously doing uh, bee workshops and I'm, I'm still working with that company to do uh, massive uh, bee installations throughout the different sites that we have. And um, so you can see in the, in the left side of this slide here, uh, the logo, it says Roofings Forever Forestry and this is just an example of the, the reach that I was now starting to have with, my, with, my, uh, with, with permaculture design and disseminating uh, the importance of reforesting the country and also reforesting it in an ethical way using African trees and indigenous species and so in the foreground here you can see this woman looking at her seedling and she's very excited to have that seedling and the fact is is that um, the Ugandan people are very 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 ready and willing to to make the right choices but the big hurdle that we have to overcome is disseminating the knowledge is actually just training them and that's why um, my, my sole focus for the last five years leading up to building a, a corporation was strictly on training and so um, we did a lot of different trainings we participated with different groups this is in the gardens of the Sheraton 
um, we set up, uh, <laughs> in Uganda we have amazing resources to draw on, so I had a truckload of soil brought in and we demonstrated swales in this little miniature mountain here. So uh, are you guys, is everybody seeing this? I hope everything's going okay. Is, is anybody else there? Anyways, yeah, I'll keep going. Really good. Yeah. Fine. yeah, good, okay. Yeah, really so here, good, Aaron. Thanks. So here you see one of the demonstrations that we've done, um, and this was this was showing people. This was at a time when the country was actually experiencing a lot of catastrophic landslides. I'm talking about landslides that are killing like 30, 40, 50, 100 people at a time. And um, you know, Uganda is a lot of the landscape in Uganda is shaped like an egg carton. It's these rolling uh, soft hills, and and the deforestation is so bad. Uh, and the rainfall is so strong that actually it is killing people directly, let alone destroying the future of the country. And so we do installations like this. This is the other side of the mound where we show no swales. And you can see the little village there that's been swiped away. And uh, <clears throat> we always made sure that there was a little church just hanging on on the edge there as we went along. So um, the Forever Forestry platform and the, the Roofings Corporation really gave us an amazing platform to start disseminating this knowledge. You can see all the all the children's shoes in the top right corner of this picture. I mean, we've, 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 we've spread permaculture throughout this country to a degree that um, otherwise would have been resting on my own personal finances and push. And, and so these types of partnerships were really part of the last five years. Here you can see us doing an installation at the Kabaka's Palace. This is in central Uganda. The Kabaka is one of the most powerful leaders in this country. It represents uh, well over one-third of the population, the, the Buganda tribe. And um, so we've, we've gotten a lot of access to the country. Here, um, through the Roofings Program, again, I was able to work with the Church of Uganda. So coming from a small little evangelical church where these people kicked me out, now I was actually being invited by the bishops, and this is uh, the Bishop Nathan Ahimasibwe of the South Ankole Diocese uh, in, in the western regions of the country. I was being invited to come and give the training to the archdeacons. And so... This was one of the most powerful moments in my life when I was actually um, training these 33 uh, church members. There was um, eight archdeacons in this photo and several staff each representing 33,000 church members in this district. And the whole program was about reforesting their district because their district had become completely deforested and people are directly suffering as a result of that. And so as a result of this five-day training workshop, uh, they are estimated to be planting 1.6 million trees, African trees, every year uh, in that district in the country. And that is one out of 111 districts whereby the church wants that training to continue. So that was a very powerful project, and uh, that was about two years ago now. And it was, it was one of the most interesting trainings I've ever done because before every class, the bishop himself would come into the room before I stood up, as, as you see in this image, and he would give a sermon, and then he would say, listen to Aaron, because everything Aaron's saying is, is, is ordained by God to be given to you today. <laughs> so it was just this, this total turnaround of being rejected by the church in the beginning and then being invited in. And, and it, it, during that time, I, I was able to spend a lot of time with the bishop, and, and um, this is the, I believe is the Protestant church, or the Anglican church. And uh, we, were, we, we talked about the Bible a bit, and I noticed that in the very first uh, pages of the Bible, God says to uh, Adam and Eve that, uh, you know, go forth and multiply, replenish the earth, and have dominion over the birds, the beasts, and the, and the fish, and so on. Uh, yeah, the, the three things, the, the animals, the fish, and the, and, the, and the birds, and the plants of the field. And I asked, the, I asked the, the, the bishop before we started the training, I said, what kind of dominion is God asking for here? And he took a few moments and he said, a replenishing dominion. And that was a key moment whereby this training really kicked off. And we used that, that saying, the replenishing dominion, to, to educate these, these, these pastors and these, these um, archdeacons and the deacons to teach the concept of a replenishing dominion. And, and I think that's a powerful thing. And I think that could spread throughout Christianity globally to help the permaculture movement further its, its mission of reforesting. Um, and so there's, there's the graduates there. So there's a lot of different graduate photos I've got. But this is the slide where I'm going to pitch over. And hopefully we can uh, play the Forever Forestry video now. 
um, which is a little CSR video that we made, and it shows you the Forever Forestry site from uh, from a bird's eye view. Yep. Okay. So I'm going to try to play this right now. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me. So we're switching it back over to me. I'm going to play this, the video, and then we'll get back to Aaron. So if there's any weird things going on, let me know. Okay. So opening up. The, are we playing Priceless Farms or the the forestry for us? Forever Farm. Okay, yeah. great. Let me open that up. Okay. Raleigh, we're still seeing Aaron's camera. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I'm I'm not sharing my. Okay, I need to. I'm sharing. Gonna share my screen. I'm just gonna switch it over to the video player. And here we go. Can everybody see that fine? Yeah. Yeah, we can see it. several key problematic issues the country faced, which they believed as the country's leading construction product manufacturer, they could have an impact on changing. These issues included soil degradation from unsustainable farming methods, drought and climate fluctuations related to deforestation, and the lack of knowledge in the common citizenship with regards to sustainable practices which are linked to so many historical factors and compound the issues facing the nation. Through a holistic approach to corporate social responsibility, the group decided it could have the greatest beneficial impact on the nation by providing practical training in sustainable arts and sciences, which have proven themselves around the world to effectively combat these very serious issues many societies face today. Thus, the Roofings Forever Forestry Guild was born. A one-acre section of land from within their Labor factory dedicated to displaying a tapestry of major sustainable practices which proved to the nation that any land, no matter how degraded, can be reforested, regenerated, and produce sustainable food, fuels, and fibers for our growing population sustainably. The site, located directly behind their PVC polypipes division on Labor Hill, is a beacon of hope to all people looking to solve national, economic, and environmental issues. Issues, standing as a living example of how even industrial wasteland can become healthy, vibrant, living ecologies and foodscapes. The site boasts water catchment systems, food, fuel and medicinal forestry, organic gardens, solar cookers, worm farms, nurseries, bee systems, a fish pond, compost toilets and many other hands-on examples of polyculture. The Roofing's Forever Forestry Training Facility offers ongoing tours and educational workshops in a variety of subjects and free fruit seedlings to all who enter. The center is also open for third party organizations to use as a space for private and or public events. And the Forever Forestry team is also available for remote training around the country for community organizations seeking to develop their capacities in sustainable practices. If you're seeing to become sustainable in life and come visit the Roofing's Forever Forestry Guild, a space created for everyone seeking to gain the right knowledge to fix the country's most dire problems. Roofing's Group, Strength of a Nation. All right, cool. So that was the video. We're turning back over to Aaron. Okie dokie. Okay. Yeah, it was, it was a little bit choppy on my end, but I hope it played through for you guys. Um, yeah, so that was the, the Forever Forestry site, that sort of triangular section of land. And that was a really big deal for me at the time because it, it was just one more step in the right direction. And uh, now I'm going to start talking a little bit more about this sort of master plan that I was talking about. So I call this the unevil master plan. Now, <clears throat> a lot of my earlier work prior to learning about permaculture design was, was dealing with youth and what is the future of these, these children. And uh, so I designed a system that basically turned the whole unemployed youth and the orphanage situation in East Africa into a massive solution. And so here you can see the concept that if we could get 
um, orphanages to have organic gardens, and we call them, you know, organic gardening orphanages, then that means that the kids in those orphanages not only would be reducing the costs and increasing their health, but they would also be having some life skills with regards to what they could do after the orphanage if they can't get to a higher level of education and go and become, you know, pilots and generals and all these things that everybody wants to be and superstar soccer players. The vast majority of them are literally ending up as prostitutes and, um, well, I would say a, a large percentage of them are ending up as prostitutes and, and destitute youth who don't have any, any, any options in life. And a lot of them become thieves and then they end up being beaten to death or burned to death and all these terrible things. It's really, 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 really hardcore stuff going on. So why not, um, as a species, give them the opportunity to learn how to do sustainable gardening and then when they're adults and they're ready to work from 18 on, give them the opportunity to have a live work farm apprenticeship on a sustainable design, uh, a sustainable agricultural property. And then in due time, as they're paying, as they're being paid and saving up between five to ten thousand dollars, which is which is absolutely possible, and you'll believe it as well when I finish with this presentation with regards to the superfood moringa and other superfoods, they can then turn into their own farms and, and create their own businesses and, and manage and hold on to their own parcels of land. So money and land are two things that right now are completely out of reach for a young adult orphan. This is somebody who's just come out of an orphanage between the ages of 18 to 30. And um, when, I show this, when I show this program to anybody, it doesn't matter what age they are, even adults who don't have jobs and are suffering immensely from economic strife, they come and they, they say, I want to do this. And so this is my this is this is really where uh, Moringa kind of came into my life, so I'll get there. So just hold on, all all the people that are waiting for the Moringa talk. So here's a group. This is a group of uh, 18 orphanage managers. So I went ahead and started. Uh, I, I I knew that it was working with the churches. I knew that it was uh, permaculture was working with the universities, and um, and then also just a diverse range of different individuals from the Forever Forestry experience. And, uh, and then I said, okay, now it's time to really focus on the orphanages. And I was blessed to meet John Vulcan and uh, Shauna Vulcan of the Vulcan, uh, of the Vulcan Academy in, in Canada, uh, or the Vulcan Foundation, which is a, which is a substantial, um, <clears throat> um, how do you call it, philanthropic program that they have in Canada. And they have a, a leg within their foundation called Lift the Children. And when I met them, I talked to them about how we could go in and we could train orphanages to become uh, less uh, expensive to operate and more healthy for the children with, with, for the children with regards to the fact that we can fix a lot of the common problems they're facing and, uh, and teach the kids how to garden. And um, so this was uh, the Gathethi OVC. This is about three months uh, after we left, uh, having found the orphanage. Uh, with absolutely nothing. They had absolutely no vegetable gardens for the kids to participate in. This entire yard that you're seeing was just a, a dirt and grass field, animals running everywhere, there was chickens in the kitchen. Um, they did have some small patches of potato and corn on a little one acre plot out behind and then they had, a, they had like a three acre uh, soccer pitch behind the um, facility that we also uh, installed. But for the purpose of, the, of this presentation, I can't go too deep because, of course, when I, when I tell you that we've got a sustainable orphanage program that we've done, it's, it's prolific. It's a very, very big program. The impacts, simply put, are absolutely astonishing uh, to the degree that they are now financing me to build a 30-acre uh, sustainable academy, basically, to train all the orphanage managers in East Africa. And I'll get to that at the end of this presentation. These are some of the best students that I've ever had. The young children who have absolutely nothing else to do with their time, who listen and learn permaculture design, experience a prolific um, attitudinal enhancing uh, uh, program here. And these young boys and, and girls who are in this facility, I've, I've witnessed some of them who had a lot of depression go to being vibrant, young, uh, happy and talkative at young adults. And I, I strongly feel that because we gave them something to do every day that gives direct beneficial results and particularly very healthy products on a daily basis, I have a feeling this is one of the most powerful um, setups. And of course, it's, it's permaculture design being given to young children who really don't know what their future is. And I love this image because 
yeah, we were having a good joke, me and this boy, uh, just talking about, you know, your hat and the, the fruit looked the same. So that installation right here, you're seeing one of the one of the fields. This is uh, seven months. This is seven months after the installation. This is just north of Nairobi in a place called Gathethi, and we built a guest house. So anybody who wants to go and visit the Gathethi Orphanage and Vulnerable Children Set Center, excuse me, it's in the Kiambu district, uh, in, in, in just north of Nairobi, and that food that food forest that you're seeing in this picture started attracting all of the local farmers because. It was the only uh, facility in that in that district that was still growing spinach even in the height of the dry season. And so this is uh, seven months after installation. Um, continuing with the program, I went down to Mombasa. We've trained 28 orphanage managers in total. You can see I'm wearing some awesome sandals in this picture. Uh, Mombasa is one of the hottest places I've ever been, but the orphanage training program was very well received, and all the people in Kenya who received their certificates in this program actually banded together and they created an association of sustainable or orphanages for sustainable uh, for sustainable livelihoods, something along those lines. The, the name is eluding me now, but it's one of these long ones. And so they're act actively um, um, pushing the government to help them to, to, to do these types of installations. Um, just going back on the orphanage thing. The first orphanage we did the install with started saving approximately 1,000 US dollars every month, three months after we did the permaculture installation. So that was a really big win and uh, we're trying as hard as we can now to build a new facility where we can pump them through. I'll touch on that later. And then another thing I really wanted to put into this presentation was just the concept that like my lifestyle and my life uh, is not just all about running around and, and dealing with ghetto situations and dealing with impoverished people because the fact is is that East Africa is the most rapidly developing economy in the world um, when you group it all together and, and countries like Uganda and a lot of the African countries have incredibly beautiful landscapes and so this is another example of where your permaculture uh, design skills can take you. It, it can literally take you in any direction you want. And so this is a hotel called Bulago. Uh, sorry, it's uh, I'm forgetting the name, but it's on an island called Bulago Island, and um, the name might come to me. But I did some trainings there, and it was really amazing because as a consultant, you can you can get your fees, you can you can charge with uh, you know money, but then you can also reduce your fees in exchange for benefits. And so I got to stay at this amazing uh, resort, and this is how I found their gardens before uh, the permaculture training and this is the gardener there his name is Steven he had never had any formal training in uh, in sustainable gardening he had been formally trained in agriculture by um, the, the agricultural institutions in Uganda and this is what his gardens looked like and obviously what you're seeing in this image is also the reason why this company wanted to hire me and this is what they turned out to look like uh, six months after the training and um, th that training was literally two days. I spent two days with Stephen explaining to him about guilds, explaining to him about life in the soil, about the impacts of sunlight, about the, the, the concept of mulching, and that mulch is not just a one-time thing, it's a continual thing, and this is how his gardens ended up looking. And uh, th he, in this image here, he was spraying chemicals all the time and to keep the bugs back because of course you know these are nutrient depleted plants and he spent about 75 percent of his time just watering the garden because as you can see the soil is exposed and this is literally one mile off of the equator so you can imagine the intense heat from the sun during the noon hours and those are what the gardens looked like six months later um, so here he is and this is these are the types of images that I like showing people is like this is what permaculture design does to people um, where before I came along without permaculture, he was struggling. His his employee his his employers were not happy with his work, and and afterwards he's basically praised as like a demigod of gardening because of how powerful and potent his his vegetables are. In fact, the hotel literally uh, cannot keep up with the amount of food he was producing there now. Um, so it's uh, these these are the these are the types of experiences that I was having that led me to believe, okay, now it's time to do this on a bigger scale. And um, so this is where we're going to go into Priceless Farms and uh, I'll just uh, talk a bit about this design here. So this was a design that I made after walking on a, on a 100 acre parcel of land. Um, 
the slope is going down into the bottom left corner of this land. The, 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 there's a creek on the very, very far left side that you can see. And this was just a very rudimentary um, conceptual design that I put in showing the different types of uh, on-contour roads uh, as a concept and then also the, the amalgamation of all the expensive resources up at the top right-hand corner um, where you have your top dams and so on. And um, I was so blessed uh, that one of my, one of my friends, uh, Joseph Goodwin, Joe Goodwin, who I had known for several years who had been working in the mining industry, he was looking to make an investment for his two-year-old daughter at the time that could be something that when she turns 18, she would never have to worry about money again in her life. And I was lucky enough to be able to convince him that tree farming was the way to go. And, um, and so he's become sort of my angel investor. And we went ahead, and over the last one year, it's been a year and two months that we've been on the on the on the on the land. We were able to um, develop this, and uh, here you see an, a drone image. This is about uh, 500 meters off the ground, looking straight down. And this is what you're seeing in this image in the left-hand side. Here is approximately 25 acres of land, um, and you can see on the edges, on the outside edges, you can see the sort of monoculture. Uh, deforestation that was happening. So the property that we came into, and you'll see it in the next video, um, it was literally a burnt out cornfield. Now, all of the dark little trees that you see there and these dark little shadows, those are all the indigenous trees. And um, a year ago when we came, they were, they were very few. And we taught, our, we taught our people, like, look, when we're, when we're doing our crops, when we're making our installations, do not destroy the indigenous trees. And what we're seeing now, this, this particular image was taken in the dry season. That's why you see a lot of dirt. Um, also just after a harvest of Moringa. But what you're seeing in this image is actually the rebirth of, of that indigenous forest. And this is an area in the country of Uganda whereby everybody is making their money from charcoal, corn, and cows. And that's it. And it's deforesting at breakneck speeds. People are living in the absolute bottom of the barrel statistically speaking in terms of poverty um, and the access to Medicare and water is not even there so we're, re we're really really on the fringe of the Ugandan cat catastrophe and we're, we're going in and we're putting in what I believe is the country's largest permaculture farm and uh, so that's what you're seeing in this image and I, I put these two images together so you could see concept to reality over the past year and a half um, what you're not seeing there is the other 230 acres, um, so, but you're going to see that in this video. And so this is where we go to the, the flyover video of Priceless Farms, Farm One, our flagship facility. All right, video time. So I'm going to play it now on my end. Give me, a f give me a few seconds and I'll pop that up. So this image you're seeing is one of the most incredible sunsets I've ever seen. And we get sunsets like that all the time because we're right on a lake. And you're going to see that in the video. All right, here we go, playing the video.
right, cool. That's the video. I'm going to turn it back to Aaron. Sorry if it's a, a bit choppy, everybody. We're figuring out the video, how to integrate video into the presentations. But, yeah, I, I thought that was great. So back to Aaron. All right. You see my screen? Everybody's there? I uh, can't see your screen right now. You can't? No. Let me know, let me know when it comes in. Okay. Hold on. Hmm. Yeah, you know, uh, show my screen. There you go. Okay, here it comes. Damn, back How's again. That? Perfect. Now back, sorry, guys. Okay, so that video was uh, Priceless Farms, and um, obviously the whole idea of Priceless Farms uh, and the name, the name came when, when we all got together. I have a group of partners that I work with, um, but the whole idea behind Priceless Farms is essentially creating a franchise system that spreads permaculture, uh, agriculture uh, throughout East Africa. And so if you, if you go back and you think about that orphanage program that I was talking about, what Priceless Farms is is it's kind of a launch pad for young young adults to first and foremost work and make and earn a living for themselves and to do it in such a way that they're learning everything there is that they want to focus on to 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 become a good farmer um, and because of course you know about 75 percent of our land is being put to forage farming it's a very easy system to actually um, maintain once you've done the installation but the installations are by no means easy, um, which is what we've been doing. And so I'll just I'll just talk a little bit about leading up to why moringa has become our primary uh, money making crop, uh, and also um, just kind of talking a bit more about Priceless Farms. So here you see some of our employees, um, some of my students. Um, the the older fellow in the in the middle here is an ex soldier. He actually fought in all three of the major last wars as a paratrooper, and he's now living and working with these other young men on this farm. And here you just see sort of a lifestyle shot that I really love. We've got lots of dogs. Um, people are really picking up the system. The trees, um, which our, our employee there is holding in the red basket, that's actually lemon eucalyptus, which has a very powerful anti-mosquito anti effect. And it's one of the most beautiful smelling oils. So we're producing, we're not only producing Moringa, we're producing dozens of different products, but Moringa is the winner. Um, in terms of finance. Um, one of the other key aspects of Priceless Farms is we, we hire uh, university students who have very little work experience but good knowledge and good linguistic skills and good mathematics skills and good analytic skills and we bring them in to work with local villagers and so the local villagers that we work with there's two opportunities. Um, they, they work as auxiliary staff whereby they come to the site, they do their jobs and on their contracts whether it's weeding fields, planting fields, planting trees, picking and so on, and, and eventually processing materials, and then they go home. But then there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's another type of villager who is uh, this gentleman on the left who are living in dire poverty, who have been kicked off of other, other, other lands, who were probably orphaned themselves at some point in their life and have their families, and they're living completely disconnected from society in the bush, struggling to survive. And all they're doing is either making charcoal for money or growing corn on somebody else's land, which is a very unstable lifestyle. And 86% of the population in this country is actually doing what we call subsistence uh, agriculture. And what this means is, is that they're not getting given the knowledge. And so we have what's called the Shamba system, the refugee Shamba system. But what we're calling it now is the priceless farms Shamba system. And really what it is, is it's permaculture as a business for rural impoverished communities and so we give them housing, we give them tools, we give them workshops and training and then we identify their different skill sets and we enhance those by giving them uh, resources to, to, to make money from those skill sets and we do a profit share structure of 50-50 and they get two acres of land to start and uh, anytime they don't have anything to do they can come and they can also get contract work at head office so it's a really really potent system and that is the, the most important thing about Prices Farms is that whatever product we're going to create, whatever market we're trying to uh, assist with products, we can do it prolifically with this, this Shamba system so that these people have a secure home where they don't feel 
that they're just going to be kicked out at any given time because that's what's happening. A lot of people get kicked out of people's land and there's this very unsophisticated approach to property development in Uganda right now. So we're trying to prove through this, uh, uh, this example that actually there is a much better way which is much more profitable and much less costly and much safer because the community that we're able to develop through the permaculture principles um, is very strong and it's very secure because these people genuinely love us as a company. It's not just, oh yeah, these are some nice white people and we're making some money. It's like, oh my goodness, these people are genuinely caring about me and my kids and our future and they're doing everything they can and so there's that reciprocity that goes on on this system and so this gentleman is an expert chicken farmer he knows every different type of local medicine to rear chickens in the tropics and he has a very very low death rate with his chickens and so right here you're seeing a workshop where we're taking new shambas new shamba uh, contracts uh, contractees and we're teaching them through by taking them on a tour so the system kind of self evolves through this immersive educational program where they're all sharing what they're learning and discovering and it's really good we have now 19 families and probably a total of about 40 to 50 people on the Shamba system on our land all benefiting access to water electricity housing upgraded kitchens and bathroom facilities tools agricultural inputs and permaculture training on an ongoing basis so that's a really important system these are some of the some of the kids on one of the other shambas, and uh, this is kind of like a, a pastime for these kids. They play. They're they're instead of just playing in a sandbox, they actually get to make their own huts and stuff. And so these are some of the kids that are living on our farm, in one of the shamba systems. And and this is the future of Uganda. These are these are the future farm managers, and these are the future permaculturalists who will um, either re-green their country or suffer from civil war. Uh, this is another lifestyle example of what we're trying to accomplish on Priceless Farms. We really want a lot of interns. This is a friend of mine. She was from Britain. She's got African and Jamaican roots, Kamara, and uh, that's her hut there. She was she was there when we were building, and she was able to help us build and paint that hut and live a lifestyle on the farm that um, basically um, gave her a really deep understanding of what it means to live a sustainable lifestyle. And so we have five such huts, and we're going to keep expanding so that we have that sort of ecotourism, but also um, eco-adventurism as well so people can come and live on the farm and eat the food where even you know almost everything that we have on that farm is uh, is from the farm um, but we have had some very difficult uh, difficult seasons which obviously I would talk about in another setup um, we are going very big uh, with this farm we're very serious about what we're doing so we are installing a very large house as you can see the foundations there and this is what we're going towards so we're out in the middle of nowhere quote unquote we're actually making it somewhere and so we're making priceless farms into this beautiful system whereby ministers and and investors and all different types of characters from around the world can come they can see this is a highly profitable business model not only for the people in the land but also for their pockets because that's what we need is we need the right type of investment and this is what we're driving towards so in about uh, six months our backyard is going to look like this and now we come to Moringa. So thanks for your patience. Let's dive into the Moringa crop. Um, all of the photos that you're seeing are my own photos. Uh, I love the Moringa tree. My first experience with the Moringa tree was actually in 2010 uh, when I came back to Uganda. I'm an explorer. I always just wander around. Whichever neighborhood I'm living in, I, I go wandering. And I always end up in somebody's garden. And I found a stump that was growing with this prolific leafy green coming out of it and I asked my Ugandan friend I said what the heck is that because it looked like one of these little troll dolls I don't know if any of you know what a troll doll is but it just looked like a really crazy plant because it was a stump about this big about, about two feet across and it had like about 90 sprouts coming out of it that were just bright neon green and he said it was Moringa since that time I started researching and learning about Moringa and to this day I, I'm still learning new things and so I'm going to share some of that with you. Um, so these are some images of, um, we tried different methods of, of installing the Moringa. <coughs> Excuse me. Typically you're trying to get about 3,000 or, or more uh, plants, uh, trees into one acre of land and uh, here you can see the carrot like root structure. Um, and I, I have a feeling that that root structure is going to be another two or three years of research for me to discover the potent qualities there. But most of 
most of uh, what we are talking about in this in this presentation is the the right hand side of this picture, the leafy green, and the power of that leafy green when it's added and used in in various different ways. And so here you can see where we're transplanting them from a nursery, and we opted not to do that because. Um, the plants suffer when you're transplanting them, but also you don't need to. The, the seed is so productive and powerful at getting itself started, you can literally just plant it like corn to establish a crop. Um, so let's jump into it. I'm going to hit you with a lot of information. First and foremost, it's known as the world's top nutrient leaf powder. Now, um, I'm giving you what I believe is the truth. But obviously, please do your own research. I might not be perfectly correct with this, but it's known as the top nutrient leafy powder from a plant. Um, it's known as the world's top antioxidant. It's uh, highly anti-inflammatory. There's 36 anti-inflammatory properties in this plant. It has overall 96 minerals and vitamins. Um, it has excellent bioavailability, bio bioavailability for uh, nutrients. Excuse me. Um, this means that you know if you take it like a multivitamin, you're not just urinating out yellow, yellow and bright colored pee because the nutrients are actually going into your blood system. They're going into your muscles, into your bones, into your liver, into your brain. It's supercharging you. It has 18 amino acids, including all nine essential amino acids. Now that is extremely rare, and those amino acids and the nine essentials are there in, in good quantity and um, so also we need more slides to get all the information in. The Moringa leaf can be fed to animals for uh, up to a 30 percent increase in milk and growth rates. This means you can increase the, the milk production in cattle and goats and so on. Uh, it can be made into foliar fertilizer for 30 percent increase in plant growth rates. So a lot of the a lot of the statistics I've found on that are like 30 and 30, both for animals and plants. We've applied it to our bird's eye chili crop, and we 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 you know anecdotally witnessed that uh, there is an, a substantial increase in the production of chilies. It can be added to fish pellets for protein increase. Uh, we're really looking forward to doing that because we got a massive fish cage project coming online. Um, and it has prol a prolific impact on human health and immunity. And when I say prolific, I mean prolific. Um, the things that I have seen over the last year of giving this to not only all of my staff, but also many, many random people and also interacting with doctors has just blown my mind uh, with regards to what this thing can do, what this plant can do for people's uh, health. I've never seen anything like it. So I'll get into that as well. Um, and the other, another beautiful point is that it's one of the most uh, easy crops in the world to grow, um, and I'll, I'll just touch on that now. So you don't need pesticides or fungicides. The, the crop has no known diseases or pests that will wipe out your crop. I have seen um, some types of moths that have infected one or two plants out of 3,000 on an acre, um, but it's typically... They, they, they eat a bit of the plant, they infect it, and then they, they, they do their life cycle, and I haven't seen them since. Um, that was once during the first harvest. Um, it's very drought resistant, so this is an excellent crop for establishing food forests, and uh, it, it provides sparse shade and so on, and it's, 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 it's got that tuberous root and that big long tap root that make it very drought resistant. It can be harvested for leaf powder in the first three months. So if there's many different uses for the moringa tree in terms of like agriculture. Somebody might be a dairy a dairy farm, and they'll say, "Let's plant 10 acres just for our cows." Um, and somebody might just be having like tomato crops, and they'll say, "Let's plant two acres just for our for our fertilizer production." Um, in this case, if you're planting it for leaf powder, um, you can harvest it in the first three months, so it's actually faster growing. I've seen I've seen the moringa tree grow to almost 35 feet in six months from a seed. Uh, and now, now this is in Uganda, uh, so you really got to come here to witness the magic of this country. And just long story short, just for those of you who are wondering how that's possible, Uganda is one of the most lightning rich countries in the world. Um, if not the most lightning rich countries in the world, this means it has a lot of electrical activity in the atmosphere all the time. And apparently this drops nitrogen out of the atmosphere and into the soils. And so I think that's why the growth rates of plants plus um, continuous uh, night and day cycles because we're on the equator and loads and loads of water and a clean microclimate. That's a whole other presentation I could give. Um, it harvests when you're when you're harvesting it for leaf, leafy green powder. 
excuse me, which is what we're doing. This is a, an example of one of the agricultural products that we're selling and also buying as well at this time. Um, you, you harvest five times a year and that's a big deal because you know it's a very stable income for, for smallholder farmers and also for larger corporation style farms. Um, the crop waste, if you have damages, for example, if a bag falls off the back of the truck and opens up, you can just send it back over to the chicken area and mix it in with your chicken feed and you have moringa enriched eggs and meat. Um, and it intercrops with most other vegetables and crops. I'm still in the process of learning which ones work the best, but we are experiencing good production from bird's eye chilies within our crops. And so here you can actually see that intercropping taking place. In this image, if you look very closely at the ground, um, you can see all these little white patches. Those are rice husks that we're using for mulch because I, I, I found that rice husks do not get eaten by termites very, very quickly, which is one of the main problems in the tropics, and particularly in, in Uganda. When you put mulch on the ground, it's, it's gone within three or four days uh, because the termites eat it. Uh, but the rice husks work very well. So here you can see the little patches of rice husks. You can see the moringa, which has just recently been harvested. It looks like maybe a week prior to this image being taken. And you can see the regrowth on those moringa stems in the foreground. Now, also in this image, I want you to notice, because the topic of this subject is regenerative moringa farming, what does that mean? To me, that means that we are growing and enabling all of the indigenous trees in the area to come up and compete with our crops. And so here you see uh, grafted mango in the far left of the foreground, and you see a grafted mango right in the top dead center um, uh, in the upper layer of this image. And behind that, you see many different types of acacias, and in the top right corner, you can see a cactus tree. We're in a very wet, dry, uh, tropic region of the country, so we do have a lot of cacti on the property. Here is an example of the resilience of the moringa tree. So this looks like it was like a five-year-old tree that got chopped down by somebody or fell over in a storm, and boom, it's going to keep going. There's a new shoot coming out of there. I hope you guys can see that image clearly. The tree is, 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 is literally the most hardcore plant I've ever worked with. Um, and then here I'm going to get into a little bit more about the science. So we've, it's recently been discovered as a powerful glutathione peroxidase producer when combined with selenium as a food supplement. Now this is very, very exciting uh, and I'm going to jump into that in a moment. I've got some more slides coming up. A steady daily intake of 500 milligrams to 2 grams can improve all major body functions and increase body weight. Now that's a very good thing in, a, in, a starv in starving places. So a lot of people in Uganda are suffering from the fact that they really only eat one full meal a day and that meal is often very void and depleted of, of nutrition. It's often just corn and beans. If they're lucky they get some meat and some greens in there. All of my staff, when we first started about one year ago, all of the staff that I hired, including those from well-to-do families who were coming from the city, they were all getting sick every two weeks, okay, every single one of them. It was a continuous happening. Everybody was constantly getting sick because it's hard work. We're in a very harsh condition on the site that we're on. When the sun comes out, it's killer hot. When the sun goes down, it's very cold. When the rain comes, it's tsunami. And so our staff were very much uh, in a state of flux between medium health to poor health. Once the Moringa crops were ins installed, I enforced a dietary regime that included a minimum of two grams per staff member. And now they're all filling out and becoming bulky. They're putting on healthy weight. And it's rare for them to get sick within even a, one, a, 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 a half a year period. Like say every six months, a staff member might get sick with a little something. But then with the Moringa in their diet, the rebound time is that much quicker. Um, and I'll talk a bit about selenium as well in, in the next slide. Drastic reduction in disease for those who are eating it. Uh, increase in vitality and strength, I just said this. Um, mental clarity has been another big one for this because of course if you have the right nutrients in your body for your body to work properly, your mental clarity is going to come up. Uh, people's sleep patterns improve and I, I have a strong feeling this has to do with the impact that the plant has on your liver and the blood system because it is so antioxidative. It helps your body to remove all those impurities, which means you can sleep better. That's my belief. I don't know. I'm not too in-depth in the science on it, but this is what I've witnessed from all the different people that I've been feeding it to. Um, and it removes toxins from the blood very well. So, you know, it's considered the top antioxidant. 
So just quickly touching on this breakthrough, um, this is this was brought to my attention by a, par, a, a friend of mine from Canada, and um, we're now formulating you know a new um, a new uh, entity to be able to, to develop more products like this, more superfoods products. But in the bottom right hand side here, you see tryptophan, cysteine, and glutamine. These are amino acids that are prevalent in the moringa pill, and uh, there was a, a doctor named Dr. Harold Foster who did a lot of research on, um, you know, how the body functions and how the immune system functions to fight back immunodeficient diseases. And when these three combine with selenium, they, they help the body to produce glutathione peroxidase. Now, long story short, diseases like HIV take away glutathione peroxidase because they consume, it consumes tryptophan, cysteine, and glutamine. And so this product is having a very potent and powerful impact on people who are living with immunodeficiency diseases and particularly it's well designed for East Africa because East African soils are practically void of selenium which is a precursor to white blood cell production and, and glutathione peroxidase so it's a breakthrough uh, that we're rapidly working to to make sure that everybody in the world can have access to this starting with the East African markets and uh, Here's some of the evidence, uh, some of the doctors in some of the clinics here, there was a particular clinic here that did um, uh, studies on HIV patients and the blue bars that you're seeing here show the CD4 counts prior to taking this supplement. You can see the supplement in the top right, right hand corner and then after taking the supplement, uh, the red bars are representing, a, 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 this, is, this is lit statistically very, very high increases in white blood cell counts or your, what's called your CD4 level after 90 days of being on this, two pills a day. Um, and so we have a prolific amount of data and we are now working with uh, all different types of doctors in East Africa to help turn this product into something that's a household, it's a, it's a household item. And we call it the world's cheapest multivitamin because it's literally costing us very, very, very little to grow the Moringa and then add a tiny little bit of selenium and boom, you've got one of the most powerful, I think it's I think it's one of the most powerful products I've ever seen and I hope that uh, anybody else out there who does the diligent research to, to understand this can also see that as well. So it's, it's an exciting thing. Another major discovery, this just happened two weeks ago, we have been massively working on getting the bees, uh, beehives onto our sites. We have uh, about uh, 80 beehives now, KTB beehives very large hives, they produce about 60 liters per year each and what we're experiencing on our site is not only um, have we created an oasis for African bees, indigenous African bees to come into our site whereby every time we bring beehives they're coming in just on their own. We don't even have to really bait them and sight them yet. They come in when they're still in the store which is very rare. But we're also now witnessing this here, this image is showing you uh, um, one of the one of the canisters that we're we're filling with rough uh, pounded uh, moringa dried moringa powder, which we mix with our chicken feed, to have these incredible eggs to come out of our chickens. And the other day, I was giving a talk. I was working with uh, a large group of people doing a bamboo plantation, and we were having a follow up meeting with about sixty people. And under the table, this bucket of moringa was just completely full of bees and I had never seen that before and I looked under the table and I stopped talking because I witnessed that there was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bees coming and going from this thing and so you're seeing the sticks on the top but the powder is underneath there so all the activity of these bees they're coming and they're taking the moringa powder and putting it on their pollen sacs and taking it back to the beehive they're literally directly eating and bathing in moringa powder um, the doctors that we work with as well who've been who've been treating patients with moringa they say it's absolutely amazing at, at at healing wounds open wounds so people who are suffering from cuts bruises and scrapes they actually put the moringa powder on the wound just like you would with uh, turmeric because it has all these anti uh, antibacterial properties and drying properties but this discovery to me um, is potentially groundbreaking because if, if all those benefits that you get from feeding it to cows and goats and feeding it to your crops are true, which they are, then it would, it would suffice to say that you know, the honey which we're now going to be getting from these bees, which is in this image, this is some of the rudimentary packaging that we're doing on the farm, 
uh, just as a tester, uh, little samples, we actually sell the honey on. The honey that we're getting is more than likely going to be some of the best honey in the world. And, and I don't know what you would call it, maybe Moringa leaf fed honey. Um, so we're really excited about that because all the health benefits are now going, you know, if you combine the health benefits of raw organic bush honey in one of the cleanest countries in the world with raw organic clean Moringa powder and you put it together, that's what you're getting. And so I'm really excited about that and uh, we're just going to start doing tests on our different batches of honey and we're keeping a storage of, of all the different batches starting from when we had very few trees and very few uh, tree cover to now a year later to two years to three years when the bees are now regimentally feeding on moringa powder and uh, so there you see the moringa powder in its raw form we believe that uh, the soils in Uganda are some of the cleanest in the world because this is an unindustrialized country and it has an updraft um, uh, sort of uh, wind pattern if you look at the global wind patterns and you, you, you hover over top of Uganda you recognize that it's actually like a biodome whereby a lot of the global winds that are around it are not actually coming in because there's this constant updraft and, and cycling loop. Um, they call it a, I think they call it a microclimate. I'm not sure if I'm getting that right, but it, essentially Uganda has its own self-cycling uh, climate, which is great because Moringa as a tree is a chelator. It actually absorbs heavy metals and toxins. And so Albeit, you know, Moringa from India, India might be the biggest producer, a lot of that Moringa is now being discovered, it's actually full of like lead and different types of heavy metals which are not good for you. And uh, that really sucks because they basically ruin their opportunity to participate in health foods. Um, and so we're hopeful that um, as we continue to develop our farm and we continue to work with all the other Moringa farmers in this region, we want to brand um, based on scientific proof, of course, which we're still collecting, we want to brand Moringa in Uganda as the Champagne Moringa. And I believe uh, Ecuador is one of the most, uh, the best producers, if not the only really clean Moringa producers in the world, um, just because of that chelation, uh, the, the, the chelation that it has. So again, this is just another image of that first shot that I showed you. This is one of my first managers on the farm. And when this fellow first started working with me, he was very, very skinny. <laughs> and in this image, I think you can see he's got a very sporty build. Uh, this is uh, Samander Martin. And uh, he's now the manager at the Forever Forestry site, and he's doing a really good job there. But this is what, this is what happens. You know, you can imagine, what, what, what does this guy look like if you shave off 20 kilos? I myself gained 10 kilos in two months after I started uh, eating two grams of Moringa a day. And um, so I, I, I know firsthand how how good this is. This is a, an image of how we prepare it on a daily basis. So this is in our staff kitchen where we're feeding any, anywhere between 15 to, to 40 people a day. And uh, I just really like this shot because it shows that fresh picked Moringa that we're eating. And uh, the, other, the other bucket, the other container there is holding uh, dodo and amaranth, which is, um, yeah, basically, well, amaranth is, is dodo in an African words uh, language. Um, so that's, yeah, that's amaranth leaves there, plus moringa. So the diet on the farm is absolutely incredible. This is another image I really wanted to show you guys. I've mentioned that we're doing chilies. There's other products which I'm not going to talk about, but um, this is our chili nursery. And so the, the, the diversity of, of the uses of the moringa tree seems to be inexhaustible. And using permaculture design science, using item analysis, I thought, hey, you know what, instead of building two acres, because I needed two acres of chili uh, nurseries, that's the scale that we need in order to plant that hundreds and hundreds of acres of chilies. Why don't we just plant dozens and dozens and dozens of uh, Moringa trees and let them grow up nice and tall. And so here you actually see the Moringa tree being used as a structure um, whereby I saved thousands of dollars in not having to build nursery covers because the moringa tree is doing the job. You can see in this shot, this is about uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It's cool, uh, it's, it's shaded and you can see the health of the, the chili seedlings in, uh, in, the lower, in the lower part of this shot. It's, it's a very nice nursery cover. So get creative with your permaculture design knowledge, get creative with item analysis and there's nothing you can't accomplish out there with all these plants. Um, this is an example of the product range that we're developing. So the product on the left here, the Mega Booster, this is the Immune Booster. Now we're selling these for about $10 a bottle. So now I'm just going to give you a quick little 
financial forecast, just so you understand um, the value of this and how wealthy we can actually become by doing the right thing with our farms. And so this is, um, this is I think, a 10 kilogram bag. Uh, and 10 kilos would sell for about $80 wholesale as this, in this form. And each kilo, um, so, so this would be $80 being sold to uh, this company here, which is called Gentera, which is manufacturing the bottles. This would be $80. So the farm gets the $80. Gentera, having built that, um, the, uh, the bottles there, would make a profit of about $420 per kilo. Um, so you can do the math there. So the cost is $8 per kilo, and after it's manufactured into these superfoods products, which are the healthiest products in the world for women, children, and, and, and general population, um, you're making about $420 per kilo. And this company that we're building, Gentera, is really uh, adamant about reinvesting the profitability from all of these large contracts that, we, that we're gaining back into sustainable agriculture so that we really do um, bring the cost of the product down, bring the cost of production down, but also enhance all of these local communities towards regenerative forestry practices. Um, so we're getting close to the end uh, of, the, of the, the presentation. I know I've gone over by about 15 minutes here. Catalyst projects, uh, moving forward, in order for all of this to work, uh, we really do need to be financially viable. Moringa is an excellent start, but there's much more than that. So we are building a 30-acre sustainable living academy. This is sponsored by Lift the Children Canada. Please check them out if you have time, liftthechildren.org. It's a very potent project. Uh, I'm just doing the, the fundraising video now, so if you're interested, please stay tuned to that. Um, in that academy, you can learn 35 practical skills. I'm also going to quickly talk about we're building a sub substantial fish cage uh, and floating garden project. And that's really got me fired up because uh, you can imagine how well floating gardens would do. Any of you who know the Chinampa system, that's essentially what we're doing over a large piece of land. I'm going to show you some beautiful, beautiful photos in a second. And we've also just begun um, what we want to turn into a bamboo industry. Bamboo has been completely overlooked uh, in Uganda, but yet it grows so incredibly fast here, and it is indigenous to Africa. We've just done a world record attempt, uh, and we planted 67 acres of bamboo in uh, 34 minutes with 400 people. So I'm just going to quickly show you that and then wrap up the whole presentation. Um, so this is uh, an example of the sort of skill sets and the, the trainings. Uh, that we're going to be doing. This is a, a group of um, this is a group of surveyors who came to the farm to map out the 30-acre academy that I acquired with the Lift the Children, and uh, I made sure that all of my staff came to learn and see uh, all my top staff to to see what it is that we were doing uh, in this process. And I just love this photo. That's Spartacus in the foreground there. Here is the landscape. Um, so the academy will actually be situated on the right-hand side of this photo, that big block that's kind of coming down the edge of the page here. And you can see there's an upper half and a lower half. Um, the, the, the property that you're seeing on the left-hand side, that's a continuation of Priceless Farms. So Priceless Farms literally comes right up against the Lyft Sustainable Living Academy. And we're just in the very first two months of breaking ground there. And actually, that entire acreage has been completely planted with various different crops to capitalize on the current rainy season and we're going into our funding and this image here I put in just to show you guys this is what it looks like when you're starting up a new property we we set up a very rudimentary makeshift kitchen and we do what we need to do to get things built um, and we start putting in roads and here you can see some construction materials this is the store going up and within the next six months there will be about uh, eight classrooms um, about uh, all kinds of stuff. We're doing all types of amazing things there. Um, the bees are on site, the trees are being planted, and there's going to be 35 skill sets that we're training. Everything from pottery to construction to obviously design science and hus animal husbandry, plants, and eco ecosystem development, and uh, yeah, sustainable living. Sorry, I'm tripping up a bit on my words. This is our fish uh, project in the very beginning stages. So what you're seeing there are 28 uh, fingerling ponds. Uh, they're all 10 meters by 10 meters by 5 feet deep. The water which is in them is, is, is in line with the lake. This is Lake Choga that you're seeing. It's in the middle of Uganda. Please Google it. Check it out. 
And the estuary that you're seeing there that we're on the banks of um, is almost half covered in hyacinth. So there's a very fine line where the hyacinth is on the water, the surface of the water, and it's meeting the papyrus, which is where those ponds are leading through into the papyrus there. And we're getting permission from the government to go in there. We're actually being requested by the government to develop a fish cage project. Now, look very closely at this image. On the far right corner, you can see a fishing village. Uh, sorry, uh, far right middle of the frame. You can see a fishing village. And you can see a little trail coming from that fishing village towards the lake. And then when you look at the lake, you realize the whole thing is completely clogged with hyacinth. And right now, that fishing village is unable to get its boats through that hyacinth. And so when I tell you that we're going to be doing um, fish cages with floating gardens, what we're talking about is turning all of that hyacinth that you're seeing there into the bed mat, into the lower subsoil mat with lake soil on top and seedlings growing in a, a fully liquefied hydroponic system that's feeding from the nutrients from the fish and also from the lake, slime, lake sludge that we're putting on top of those gardens. It is the most rapid vegetable production system in the world. Because you're on the lake, I have a very strong feeling there's going to be very few pests and diseases. Uh, the plants are going to be the healthiest plants in the world, I think. Um, and they're feeding off of the fish nutrients. So we're recapturing all of those foods that we're going to be feeding to our fish. So we're looking at putting anywhere between 1,000 to 4,000 fish cages out there, which will generate about $3 million annually. Those are very, very rough numbers. Uh, we're still crunching the numbers. We still have to get this pro program off the ground. But what you're seeing there is the beginning of a, a massive lake restocking and uh, wealth creation program for this section of the lake. And it will also become a template for all the lakes in Africa to be able to mim mimic that style and methodology of business. And so there it is from above. Uh, you can see the different channels there. Now, um, the channel on the left is going to connect to the lake. That's where we keep our boats. And it's a very big channel. Uh, it's hard to see in this picture. Um, we also have our water pump there. And there's an image looking back up into Priceless Farms. So you can see we're kind of in a valley. Um, and Priceless Farms is up on the right-hand side, and it also controls most of that valley there. And so that's a, another beautiful image that I wanted to show you guys. Uh, and of course, this is our bamboo partner. This is uh, Divine Nabawezi. She developed uh, roughly 12,000 bamboo seedlings, which we then did a world record attempt. And we planted on an, an, another uh, 67 acres in, in partnership with, uh, with the landlord, uh, Arthur, who's actually um, leasing a lot of this land to us for these projects. And he's, and he's one of the business partners as well, a wonderful guy. So there we are loading up the seedlings and this was the world record attempt and I wanted to show you this image because obviously what I'm, what I'm giving you is a very prolific uh, amount of information but also to show you that even in the country like Uganda, the, the step by step diligent process of masterminding a, a platform that can change the world is actually happening and we are actually getting to that point now where Everybody in the country knows us. We are, we are drawing massive media attention. We are drawing massive religious and political attention in the right way. And this is something that every person we meet, all of these different projects, every person we meet can buy into this because it's profitable, it's beneficial, it's healthy, and it's fun. And uh, so I, I think that that's, uh, that's pretty awesome. And so that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, if you want to get in, in contact with me, my email is aaronelton.lol at gmail.com. That stands for Love on Land. That's my uh, consultation company. Um, and check us out at uh, www.pricelessfarms.com. And, uh, yeah, thanks again to Neil and everybody else who's put this together. I really appreciate your time and your attention. Well, that was a cool presentation, but, you know, I got an herb spiral in my backyard. So. <laughs> I'm off. No, that, that, that's mind blowing, man. That's that's incredible. Uh, well, we'll send out your email in the replay to the webinar, just so people can like whoosh, send you direct messages. If they're uh, man, I, that when you talked to me yesterday, I was like, gosh, I need a bunch of moringa, and I need it right now. I mean, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, go and and get yourself uh, some Seleno XL selenium as well. 
and uh, yeah. take one of those every day uh, and then take about, yeah, take like a teaspoon of Moringa. Don't cook it. You don't want to kill the amino acids. It's like a you smoothie, know, eat, right? Eat it in your smoothies. Put it in, you know, soup after it's cooled down below 40 degrees. Um, and yeah, if, if you do that, you're going to be, you're going to be feeling awesome. Um, That's bad. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. After a farm, living on a farm for six months, I lost a bunch of weight. So, gain that back on for winter time. So, <laughs> Q and A time. I'm sure a lot of people got some amazing questions coming up. So, why don't we get started? Uh, Aaron, can you see the the questions rolling in, or do you want me to read them to you? I can't. I'm gonna I'm gonna cut off my my screen. Do we want to cut off my screen here? Uh, yeah. Gonna, hope, you guys, uh, we so can read them. Screen. We can we can read them. Okay, Neil, uh, I'm low on power. How about you read, uh, deal with the questions? I'll be back in like two minutes. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, I'll be back in a cool. second. All right. Um, I just want to make a couple comments here because piggybacking off of what we did last week, um, there's a lot of similarities here between you and me. You just happen to be in a place that's fertile. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I'm, I'm envious of that. But um, I think one of the most important things that you talked about is that you got to a point where you found key points in local power structures, um, particularly through the church. And at first you failed, and at first I failed too, and then eventually you got to a point where your circle of influence brought you to that place. But that's where your social leverage came from, was you found some really crucial nodal points uh, where you could get social leverage. Um, and then you learned to sing the song, you know, when you were talking about um, replenishing stewardship. Uh, that's singing the song, which is something we talked about last week. Um, but I, I mean, I was geeking out over here, Aaron. You're doing fantastic work. I love it. I'm sure our audience loves it. Let's get to some questions, folks. Thanks, Neil. Uh, we did have a question about growing moringa in the U.S. And I, my understanding of you're doing moringa oleifera, is that correct? Yeah, but we we've got a mix. We've got a mix, um, and so we realized that the seed buyers that we were um, that we were buying from, they, they, they had a mix of seeds. So we've uh -huh. got two different mix. We've got one that's meant for animal animal feed production and then one that's meant for the sort of the superfoods market. Yeah. So I'm really interested in figuring out what is the major nutritional difference between these two because I think it's going to be very, very minimal. But at the same yeah. time, what we're doing is we're, we're, we're zeroing in on all of the right ones for the human products and we're allowing them to go to seed now. Um, yeah. And then any new partnership and any new partners that come on board with new land because uh, I've got another 400 acre site site coming online I've got a 60 acre site that's already under un, under the works and, and now I have the exact seed stock so I've taken control over my own seed production within six months cool yeah um, I my yeah. understanding is in the US Moringa will grow well anywhere it doesn't freeze yeah correct, yeah. correct? And, yeah, it and when it when it does when in places where it does frost, will they grow back? Like, do they die down and grow back once it gets warm again, or does the frost just kill them off? I think it would depend on how long the frost stayed for. Um, but I, you know, I wouldn't be able to answer that question. I, I think it would kill it personally, because yeah. that's what I've read. Um, but uh, but I have a feeling that if the frost was only like one night and then it was gone the plant could regenerate. It depends on how much life is left in the root. I think I think the root of the plant is where all the primary life force is stored. And so as long as there's a little kernel of life still in there, it's going to survive. Uh, I find that's true on the Moringa we're growing, uh, but on the flip side where we have stuff that it gets too hot and too dry and it dies, um, but then we will get shoots coming off. Right. Uh, once it cools down a bit. Yeah. Uh, but we're doing we're doing moringa peregrina where we are, and primarily for oil production, uh, because that's the only one that will grow where we are without serious irrigation. Uh, we've got a question from Gabrielle. She says, 
based on what you are seeing with African bees being so attracted to the Moringa powder, does it seem feasible that such a reinforcing material may reinforce bees under threat from various viruses around the world? Ooh, that's a big one. Let me read that again. Based on what you're seeing with African bees so attracted to Moringa powder, does it seem feasible that such a reinforcing material may reinforce bees under threat from various viruses around the world? That was one of the first things that I thought of when I, when I saw that because um, typically if you watch a bee going onto a flower full of pollen, you'll see it gets in there, it gets the pollen, it puts it on its pollen sacs, and it's off to the next flower. But when they go into the, the, the Moringa bucket full of Moringa powder, they, they actually spend a long time and they seem to be pushing their head in and pushing it all over their, all over their leaves and down their, down their thorax and coating themselves in it. And we, we, spend, we spend a lot of time watching these bees do this, me and my, my bee expert uh, friend of mine. And uh, so we think they're bathing themselves in it. And, 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 and you know, cross-pollinating cross information from the doctors that I've been speaking with and interviewing and working with, when they tell me that a, a patient has a bad wound, you know, because a lot of people, they don't treat their wounds quick enough in Africa and it, and it gets infected very quickly. He, he's been putting it on their wounds and it has a rapid healing effect. Um, so I would believe so and I would hope so. But again, I just, I just, I just saw them eating this two weeks ago, so my mind is spinning to, to figure that out. Any other questions here, folks? I'm not seeing any. Yeah. How many? How many? Does it show how many people are watching right now? Yeah, there's, there's about <laughs> 55 on right. 58, almost 60. Um, let's see. Did, did you guys already answer the other ones? Yeah. Okay. Um, did you answer one from? Okay, here. So, is it not good to eat if you plant it in polluted areas? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, so a good friend of mine named Sebastian Roberts has been doing extensive research on that. Um, he's got a company called Vitago, which is just getting started in the U.S., and um, he's an absolute uh, stickler for quality, and he's found that the only Moringa he'll ever buy is from Ecuador, um, from a facility in Ecuador, which is completely clean soils, the environment is clean, but he he did he did his own personal tests in in one of Canada's top labs. He went around to every major supplier of moringa in Canada, probably about I don't know twelve to twenty products, and he independently tested them. And he said they're not acceptable to me. They've got lead, they've got different types of heavy metals, they've got arsenic in some cases, and they're passing F, they're passing organic certification. And he says, who cares if they're organic if they're full of if they're full of metal? Yeah. But I'm not, I'm not an expert on that subject. Um, I feel like I'm friends with experts on that subject, and that's, what I'm, that's the information you're getting from me right now. We've got, we've got a curious question here. Can you loudly tell my wife who is listening that your first best business contact was while drinking at a bar? <laughs> yes, definitely many of my favorite business contacts I met at the bar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. I've actually, you know, it's funny. Most of the projects that I've started with partners who had serious capital, um, it was at the bar. It was, you know, when you're when you're socializing and getting to know who somebody really is as a person. That's when business can really come to fruition outside of the bar. Because I think, um, yeah, I mean, different types of people connect in different ways. But, yeah, it's happened twice now. Two of my biggest projects happened because I met somebody while at the bar. <laughs> uh, we got a question about the John Vulcan Foundation. Mm -hmm. Did they work with other countries in Africa and particularly in Tanzania? Uh, they do. They have approximately 75 orphanages that they sponsor throughout East Africa. I know that they have a couple in South America as well. Uh, however, my personal knowledge about the spread of the orphanages is not that strong. Most of the orphanages they have are in Kenya, and uh, I believe there are some in Tanzania, but uh, that would be something I would suggest you go to, um, 
you, you talk to them. You can, you can reach them through their website. They've got good response times. You can actually call uh, Kira, I believe, is the name of the woman who answers the phone. So you can go and get their phone number and call them and ask, and she'll, she'll help you with that information. Cool. Okay, question from Harold. So as a beekeeper, should I buy Moringa powder and put the bee and make the bees rub around it? Yeah, I, I don't think it can hurt. Uh, <laughs> I mean, when you observe the bees' behavior, it appears as though they they absolutely love it. Um, yeah, so I, I wouldn't, I, I don't, I, I don't think it would have a negative impact. Uh, but put it out and see what happens. Yeah, I would say go for it. Okay, so another question. Uh, I think you already asked, you showed it like about the termites, but it was like, do you cover the exposed ground with wood chips to retain moisture? Just, um... uh, yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. So in the tropics, and particularly in Africa, um, termites outweigh all the mammals on the continent of Africa. Um, so what that means is, and that's just one insect, okay, <laughs> that eats wood chips. And so when you put mulch on the ground here, like Neil was saying, this is an extremely fertile place. What that means is, is that your life cycles and your death cycles are massively sped up compared to other places in the world, like, for example, a garden in Canada where you can put mulch down and it'll still be there two years later. Here, you're lucky if you have mulch on the ground for two weeks before it's just bare earth again. And so the name of the game in the tropics to me is living mulches after establishment. You must take a step back in the sense that you have to weed your, you have, in an agricultural system, you have to take a step back to weed the garden. There is a damaging impact for a very short period of time while you're establishing your seedlings. And then, you, like I said, I use rice husks because I found that rice husks, one, they're extremely cheap. I'm spending about 35 cents for uh, a 25 kilogram sack, which is the size of a giant mailbag. And um, so I'm probably spending about $8 an acre for all of my mulch um, to get these seedlings established. And then uh, after that, you've got to install living mulch. And again, that's another challenge to overcome because you've got to choose what you want to use. Yeah. But no, I don't use wood, I don't use wood chips at all. They just, they just get completely consumed. Unless I had some sort of a wood chip factory nearby and I could get it for free and just have it as a routine. But the point is that would actually attract the termites to my, to my crops. And sometimes the termites can transfer from things like wood chips and woody mulches. They can transfer from that onto your crop um, to go after the, 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 I believe they're going after the sugars and the juice in the, in the stem of the plants. Yeah. Nice. Good question. So, do you think moringa could be used uh, as a plant for phytoremediation? In heavily, what is the rest of the question? In heavy metal soils. 100%. Yeah. I think the chelation process that that plant, uh, or the chelation uh, attribute that the moringa tree has, I think it makes it one of the world's best uh, toxin removal uh, tree because it's it's just so good at absorbing everything that's in the soil. Uh, very like it's it's a massive miner, right? So it's very similar to uh, comfrey in that sense. And so yes, I think so. And uh, but but then what do you do with the what do you do with that uh, residue? Do you, you feed it to um, feed it to mushrooms, I guess, to deal with those toxins. Yeah, I think it's an absolutely brilliant plant for that. And I would love to do tests like that on our facilities. You know, pour some oil on the ground and <laughs> do some micro re <laughs> restoration using using the using the byproduct of the moringa trees. I think it would work. Absolutely, it's a very interesting subject. Yeah, totally. Okay, so a, a next question. I I know this. I I feel this one. It's like because when you go to Indonesia, all you see is palm oil everywhere. It says, is there any yeah. risk of moringa creating a monoculture potentially? Risks in creating mor moringa monocultures. Um, I think any time that you do a monoculture, you're, you're, you're obviously creating a void of biodiversity. And so it's a difficult question to really talk about in a quick uh, answer. Like it's not really a black or white answer that I could give. Um, 
in the methods that I'm deploying, as you saw in the images, where we are uh, intercropping not only with trees but also with other vegetable crops. Um, but if somebody were to do moringa monocultures, which is what most people are doing, because people are very most people who are not trained in permaculture design are very narrow-minded with respect to how they want to do agriculture. I want to do moringa, and that's what I get, and that's all you do for a thousand acres, and that's it. I think that's terrible. Um, is, is the Moringa the best product for people to be eating in the world? Yes, that's great. So how do you weigh those balances, you know? If I get a thousand acres of Moringa in a monoculture, I can actually effectively stop many, many different diseases from killing people in this country. So it's really difficult to, to find the balance, right? Um, so, you know, when I do monocultures, if I do do monocultures, I do them in strips on contours across the land and I make sure that there's very robust biodiverse uh, plantings around that, particularly food forests. Um, so for example, I've also got a design method whereby every corner of every acre gets a, a miniature food forest of a minimum of three fruit trees and then like six uh, legume supporting species in, in, in there. So I'm, I'm really into getting this sort of like chunky patchwork done that's, uh, yeah, causes for a good work environment five years down the line when everywhere you walk there's mangoes and guavas and papayas and everything falling off the trees. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it could be bad, but if it's curing people of disease in your country, then go ahead and monoculture a couple thousand acres. Cool. Good response. Okay, so... Another one's from Ben. How much of the learning have you done with soils during your time has arisen from trial and error, and how much has been off-the-shelf permaculture that you've uh, read from books? Oh, wait, how much has been off-the-shelf permaculture or other techniques from local knowledge? And what length of courses do you usually offer locals that you work with? So I guess kind of a okay, two-part question. Good questions. Good questions. Um, I would say 90% of my uh, learning with soils is, is uh, from experience and from, from uh, observation. Uh, and then the other 10% is just, yeah, like, you know, uh, reading and, and knowledge-based stuff. But definitely I've learned 90% of my information about soils from trial and error. Um, and I'm still going through it. I mean, it's a continuous process because the, 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 the landscapes that we're working with here, they change so rapidly. When you do an installation, within one year, it's a completely different environment. Most people walk back onto my sites, even especially with the orphanages, uh, because you, you, you have these compacted, nothing playgrounds, and then they suddenly turn into these massive food forests, and people come back and they think, is this the same place? And so my whole... My whole approach to, to developing systems and working with soils is, again, it comes back to biodiversity. Stack as many different plants in as you possibly can. Make sure you cover off on your targets in terms of like product yields that you've targeted that you want to accomplish on that land. And every other square inch and space, allow other plants and flowers and insects to come in and work and move around. On our farm, uh, when we originally started, mostly there was just corn and, that, and, and a few spotty little trees here and there that were really struggling because they keep getting burnt twice a year by this slash and burn. I've got these images of these huge bushfires coming towards us and we had to beat them back. Now, a year later, when, when there's a light on and the light is hitting a wall on one of our classroom structures, there's anywhere between 40 to 100 different types of moths on that, on that wall because we've stopped the fires from coming in and periodically killing all of their larvae and now they have, a, they're, they're regenerating their numbers. And so that's, that's, a, really big, that's a really big thing. Um, am I off topic right now? Yes, I am. Um, what length of courses do I usually offer to locals? Um, anywhere from 20 minutes. I've had successes with talking to gardeners for 20 minutes and I came back a year later and they had like six acres of food forest completely developed because their traditional culture uh, was food forestry cultures and I just reminded them of it. Um, but the actual courses that I offer go for five days. Yeah. But uh, the Academy, the Sustainable Living Academy has four different courses which I can go into some detail but one of them is a, a six month program, one of them is a one month program, one of them is a two week program and one of them is a three day program. That's uh, for different different types of society 
different types of people in society. Yeah. Awesome. So next question is from Kevin. What nutrients does the moringa take out of the soil, and will you soil test and remediate? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, although I think if you look at the list of nutrients that are contained within within the uh, moringa leaf and within the moringa tree, you'll get your answer. Um, we uh, take about twenty percent of all of our leaf powder as we're um, drying it. And before it goes to drying, we actually um, crush the leaves, the fresh leaves, and we mix them with water to create a very dark uh, moringa fertilizer. And we reapply that to the soils. As well, we intercrop with many different types of flowers. Um, we've got all different types of indigenous flowers that we allow to grow in and amongst the crops and on the edges of the fields. And so um, we will be doing soil tests. I haven't done any soil tests. Um, but definitely that's something that we will be doing to maintain the health of the soil in those crops. Every five years you're, you're meant to uproot the moringa crop and then replant. And so I think if I were to do that during that time, five years down the road, I would really inject a lot of manure. Uh, we're lucky because we're surrounded by cattle culture, uh, not in the sense that cattle culture is causing deforestation and keeping it that way and making it worse, but in the sense that we have massive deposits of uh, cow manure as well and then we've also got the lake resource so we have a two kilometer pipeline that we put in one meter under the ground which sucks lake water from the swamp all the way to the very top of our land and that water is absolutely chock full of nutrient and so that's that's coming on a continual basis when the sun comes up there's three four thousand liters an hour coming out to the very top of our land and of course the swales are all interconnected so that nutrient flow is constantly going in. Another thing we've done is we've put our animal systems on the top of our land as well. So we do have that sort of passive cycling uh, nutrient flow on, on the site. Good question. Awesome. Wow, that's, that's really cool, the interconnected swales. So, uh, question from Thomas, how does a recent permaculture grad get involved to get going? Uh, that's, that's a very open question. Um, anyone, anyone is more than welcome to come over to Uganda on your own terms. Uh, you got to be very headstrong um, and, and self-motivated. Uh, we're not here to uh, babysit anybody whatsoever. Um, I have absolutely no patience for people who expect more than what my own staff are actually making and getting. Um, which is something that I'm going to continuously improve uh, as the farm goes into profitability mode, which we are not in as of yet because we're still in our first year of development. But anybody is welcome to come and join us. Um, we're very, very friendly people, and uh, we, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm assuming get involved means get involved with, with us in Uganda. Um, yeah, you, you, can, you can just email me and say, hey, I want to come over to Uganda and hang out with you guys, and then uh, go from there. You know, we're not we're not a very uh, institutionalized institutionalized institution. We're a very open open-minded, open-hearted institute um, uh, company. Uh, we are driving towards profitability in the right way, and anybody who wants to participate with us can come and be friends, and uh, we'll help you. You know, I'm I'm more than open to share all of all of the knowledge and wisdom that I've gained with whoever has that frame of mind that I want to actually do something. And, uh, and add value. I think that's the biggest thing. A lot of people make the mistake of coming over to Africa thinking it's all about them. Uh, and uh, and, it's, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit of a tragedy that I, I don't have any time for people who think that it's just about them. Uh, so if, if you're willing to actually put your own personal uh, issues uh, into a jar and then come over and, and be selfless for a few months, come on over and you're going to have the best time of your life. That's, that's great. So, another question from Karen. Can you use Moringa as a mulch? That's uh, three down? Yeah. Okay, so we're jumping down. Karen Hope, can you use Moringa as a mulch? Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, uh, again, like I was saying, you know, I showed you how you can use it for all these different inputs, but you can also use it as a structure, and I don't know, I would, I would see mulch as a structure but again, is that the best use of the of the of the plant? I don't I don't think it's a, I don't you know it's a great it would obviously be an an amazing mulch, but I think by crushing it up, 
and mixing it with water um, and then feeding those uh, hard residues that come out of that process to things like chickens and goats as like a curd or not a curd as a, as a yeah like as a residue then you're getting nutrient rich uh, manures which you can add to your crops as, as a mulch somewhat and then you're spraying uh, all those nutrients and the nutrients are going in that much that much that much quicker yeah Awesome. So you, you have a lot of moringa seeds. Sorry, just to continue. If you have an, an overabundance of moringa seeds, it's an amazing cover crop because it grows so quickly. You know, within one week, you you'll have plants like this high coming out of the ground. And if if that's one every every centimeter, you have a seed in there. You're gonna have an amazing cover crop that you can then till into the ground. Yeah, that's great. So. Okay, get, next question from Gabriel. That's kind of a few part question. So she says, Love your idea and actualization of the Shamba system for rural refugees and employment training. What does Shamba mean? Do security issues ever come up when strangers roll up? Uh, and the last part, are there disharmonies between different tribes of people coming into a system like that? Yeah. Okay, well, I'll, I'll start with the Shamba. So Shamba was developed by the British when they were kind of lording over Africa um, and, and their, their different territories that they were maintaining through might and, might and power. And so they were very interested in doing forestry. And so they created the, the system called the Shamba, whereby they parceled out the land into blocks that could be cultivated and cleared during the first stages of their of their plantation development for different things like teak, mahogany, um, ebony, all these different tree species that they, the British Empire wanted to massively produce in countries like particularly in Kenya. And so the Shamba system was a method through which um, they would give that parcel of land which had an X number of trees and as long as that person weeded and grew their crops around those trees and protected the trees they could live on that land and make a, a subsistence living from it. So Shamba is actually kind of a, a, a sort of a negative uh, thing that came out of the British Empire, but it was it was a design that at the time the colonial Brits put in to manage their land. So the priceless farms Shamba is a total revolution of that original concept, whereby you're endowing somebody with land and then giving them much much more. You're they actually have a small salary as well, um, and 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 like I said in the presentation, all these other added benefits and training and community interaction, and you know we've already built a, a youth facility for all of the kids who live in these shambas, so that they're not just aimlessly wandering around the farm. They can go to that youth facility, play video games, do after-school activities, interact with international teachers who have this sort of homeschooling attitude towards teaching kids to be creative and, and to think um, in, in, in new ways and learn new artistic skills and talents. So uh, what else? Do security issues ever come up when strangers roll up? Um, very rarely. Are there disharmonies between different tribes of people coming into a system? Sometimes you do have uh, different men will actually kind of face off uh, because there's a, sometimes there's like when somebody is disrespected uh, they, they obviously, just like any one of us, they get angry and uh, so we have had a couple disharmonies but they always get solved very quickly, um, particularly with regards to the fact that this is a company, it's a corporate context and um, I have, we have about 10 different tribes all working in harmony and I wouldn't say it's perfect harmony but I would say that nothing has happened that has led to any form of criminal behavior. Um, in the 12 months that we've in the in the 13, 14 months that we've been here, only one one tablet has ever been confirmed stolen, and then other items that were even thought that they were stolen, they turned up later on at, on top of door sills and hiding underneath of couches, and so we actually we, we have a very safe environment in the sense I don't I don't lock my doors at night. Uh, I leave my cell phone and my my glasses and my computer out all day long everybody on the farm is charging their cell phones in one room and they all leave and there's no camera systems and when they come back at the end of the day after there's been 60 people working on this farm all their cell phones are still there and that is magical that is really I love that question actually because it really gave me the chance to express that but that's one of the biggest accomplishments that this system is proving is that we do not we don't have that criminal poverty mentality on our farm anymore 
and the local community is very respectful of what we're doing because we have that people care principle in everything that we do. Nice. Great question. Yeah. So, uh, question from Fernando. He's a uh, he's he was just working um, with Ernst Gutsch in Brazil. He says on the mulching, any living plant to use as a chop and drop mulch. Ah, uh, man. There's there's hundreds of different types of uh, trees uh, and shrubs. Um, chop and drop. Yeah. I mean, typically you're looking at your different like uh, your different. Uh, what are they called? Uh, the name is eluding me. Sorry, my brain is starting to slow down a bit, you guys. Um, cassia, is it cassia? Anyways, there's many, many different types. Uh, I would just suggest look into it. You know, one of my one of my weaknesses, just so you're all aware, is actually remembering names of things. <laughs> so if you came to my farm, I could walk you around and say that one, that one, that one, that one, and then you could actually do it and see it. But remembering the names right now is uh, is kind of difficult for me. So. I'm not going to be able to answer that too well. But uh, sweet potatoes are amazing. Uh, sweet potatoes are super amazing in the sense that you don't have to chop them and drop them. You can just stick them a foot in the ground on a flat surface. Don't harvest the potatoes. Uh, and, and, you know, if it seems like it's overgrowing or it's overcrowding your crops, just go in there with a slasher and hand slash it down, and that's a perfect chop and drop mulch. Except I wouldn't say drop because it's a ground cover. You just say chop. It's a chop mulch. It's just going to be there. It's like a salad. Yeah, so look into the, the sweet potato vines. Once they get established, you have an unlimited supply of sweet potatoes coming out of the ground. It just keeps growing and growing and growing. And it's a great animal feed as well. Great for pigs. Oh, I bet. Oh, pigs would love sweet potatoes. So a follow-up question. To, uh, yeah, do chickens or turkeys like to eat termites? Nice. <laughs> I actually have developed uh, a system whereby we chop a termite mound in half, knock the top off like an like opening an egg and we put the chicken we put the chickens uh, fenced in around a termite mound like that and the chickens come and they go absolutely bonkers for the termites termites are also very good human food as well they're really really rich in protein and different types of oils um, and they're non-toxic uh, for for consumption but chickens I did a lot of tests when I was working with the forever forestry site we did a lot of tests and we witnessed a we doubled the egg production in one week of our chickens from feeding them termites every day. And the luster in the chicken's feathers and the, 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 the chubbiness, like the chickens became chubby. Like within one week, it was like, oh, these chickens are chubby. They're, they've got a shine to their feathers like they never had before, and they're producing twice as many eggs on average. So yes, absolutely. Um, so the technology that we developed, though, is one, to fence your chickens in with a termite mound that you hack open on a daily basis with a hoe. That's a really rudimentary smallholder farmer system. Another system I tried out, which is going a little bit into the fringe, is putting a, a metal chassis over top of the termite mound once you cut it in half, allowing the mound to rebuild. And then we put a, a car jack underneath of it so that once the termite mound, which is a, you know, a one-ton structure, is built up again, we could chop, car jack it open agitate it with a thing of grass and then the termites come pouring out the sides and then the chickens eat them all up and you drop it down and you do it again the next day and you do it again. But that's a bit of a ridiculous system. It was just a way of, you know, just I was going a little bit off the, off the hook with the idea. And now my, the next system that I want to do, because like I said, termites on the continent of Africa outweigh all the mammals on the continent of Africa. That's all the elephants and the monkeys and the people and, and the dogs and the cats and the rats and the, you know even the rabbits. It's crazy when you think about that. They could be a global animal feed supply. It could go into our cat food. It could go into our dog food. It could go into our fish food for fisheries. We don't need to be stripping reefs of all these small fish in order to feed other fish like salmon. We could actually use termites to do that. And again, it could also be used as human food. I, I personally eat a lot of gra grasshoppers. I eat them almost every day. Um, so the other system is to get a Hoover, a Hoover vacuum that actually attaches onto an oil drum. You drive up to the termite mound, you open it up, there's a, there's a central shaft, and then stick the vacuum cleaner down there with a, with a swivel bristle and several holes on it and just, just suck them up. And no matter where you go in Africa, as long as you drive or go for 10 meters in one direction, you're going to hit another termite mound. 
another 10 meters, another one, another 10 meters, another one. It's just, I'm, I'm, I'm actually been working on that technology. I'm about to, I'm about to start trials in 2017 and see if we could create a food supplement like that. Because if I could do that, whoo, the fish project will be very lucrative because the biggest expense in fish is obviously creating the feed. So we're really trying to figure that out to get it down to almost nothing. Oh, that termites. The food, Perfect. the future. Yeah, the, the, the global food food supply future. for all your little cats and dogs. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, another question from Gabriel: Will bamboo will bamboo be used as a building material and also as a soil clean cleanser, like biochar? Uh, yeah. So, uh, biochar generator is one of the one of the primary targets that we have four years out. So, four years from now, we want to see if we can get a grant to put one of those together. Um, immediately, we planted it specifically for, excuse me, for the fish cage project. Um, as I told you, we want to do 4,000 fish cages. They're all going to be made from bamboo, which floats, and it also comes alive once it's in the water, and you just have to trim it back. Um, and again, like I said, those ba the bamboo will be pieced together in slats to create um, uh, floating gardens as well. So we're going to have a very, very beautiful, um, massive aquaponic system out, out there on that lake and it's all manufactured from bamboo the whole thing bamboo galvanized wire and jerry cans with with pvc glue on the ends you know just all tied together uh, very simple stuff for you. yeah okay question from harold can you recommend any good bars where we can do a follow-up meeting with you huh is he in kampala <laughs> Any, anywhere. Uh, I live on top of, when I'm in the city, I'm actually, I'm on top of a shopping center uh, in an apartment, but um, Otters, Otters has just opened up. It's just down from the, uh, from the Kololo airstrip uh, behind the Total gas station there. You just go behind Total and curve around. So definitely I'd love to hang out and meet you. That'd be great. But anywhere else is fine as well. Okay, yeah. question from Leslie. Is Moringa a hardwood? Absolutely not. No. Um, a Moringa tree that's like five years old will have about this much growth and I could literally come up to it and push it over and break it. It's one of the softest, it's one of the softest trees I've ever come across. It's very, very soft. But again, uh, when, you, when you talk about, you know, uh, what, what would you say? Uh, it makes it very wind resistant. You're never going to see a Moringa tree, it's, it's very rare to see a Moringa tree snap in the wind because it's so bendy. And also the leaves are so sparse that it doesn't have a lot of wind resistance. But no, it's absolutely not a hardwood. It's it's likely the softest tree on the planet. I don't know. I, I, that's a bold statement to make, but I've never found anything softer. So the next one is about charcoal. You guys there still? Yeah, yeah, we're, we're there. there there's, there's a lot of questions. <laughs> Great. Uh, That's great. So yeah, next question so, from Naomi. Yeah, so I've got them here uh, related to charcoal and deforestation. Since I'm assuming most Ugandans cook with fire, are you incorporating fuel woods or using moringa for alternate fuel wood? Have you seen the effects that some of these sites and projects have had on the local patterns of charcoal production and deforestation? Uh, that's a big one. It's a long one. Um, they do mostly cook with fire. 93% of the energy consumed in Uganda is coming from forestry products, which means firewood and charcoal. So that's that. Um, are you incorporating fuel woods? 100% we are doing three major types of forestry. Uh, food forestry, uh, which I think Moringa falls under. Medicinal forestry, which again Moringa kind of crosses over into that. But there's all different types of medicinal trees that we're planting as well, Matubula and, and so on. Um, even the guava leaf, we're going to be using the guava leaf in our fingerling production because it enhances the libido of tilapia when you feed it to tilapia. Who knew? Um, the Filipinos knew that. But uh, anyways, and then we're doing, we're doing uh, craft wood and, and firewood. So I guess that's four in total. Yeah. So definitely we are doing that. Um, then the last thing is uh, the patterns of charcoal production. Well, definitely on our site, which is all that we have total control over. There's no more charcoal production, but uh, it would take several 
more years for the economic systems that we're doing to branch out through our franchise structure and through our Shamba structure and through our outgrower structure to the point where people no longer have to produce charcoal uh, for, for a stable income. But as it is right now, we're just getting going. We, we, we came into the middle of this, this desolate region in the country and so it's going to take a few years. But on our site, it's a, it's a totally different world now. You, you have this stark contrast on our site where you've got this totally unsustainable culture on one side of the, the boundary line and then you cross over just one foot over and boom, you're in this permaculture paradise where everybody's happy, healthy, working and, and feeding and eating good food. And, uh, and yeah, people love coming to work on our farm actually because they're coming from these really poor situations and they, we, we put out all these different types of contracts that people can come and they can do their weeding for the day, they get a lunch, then they go home with 5,000 shillings in their pocket, you know. Um, and when, you know, that adds up. And, and eventually, uh, we're going to have financial kickback. Like I said, we're going to make ridiculous amounts of money when we start hitting these superfoods markets with these new products that we've developed. Um, and, and we're going to kick back most of that profit straight into these communities' development, you know. So they won't have to do charcoal. It's my prediction they won't have to do charcoal and also they will reforest their landscape because they will see that having patches and patchworks of forests around their crops are, is actually very, very beneficial and very much needed. And uh, it's just a matter of communicating that. Yeah. There's a lot. Yeah. Okay, so question from Thomas. Uh, Two-part question. Do you test the soil for pollutants before you eat moringa? And do you have any computer programs to make your designs with? Um, I do all my designs by hand, uh, and then I and then I hand them off to people who have a more uh, meticulous uh, skill set with regards to putting them into digital format. Um, so no, I don't I don't have any uh, computer design uh, computer software for design. Um, and we do not test our soils before we eat the moringa on our site because we know the history of our site. There has been absolutely no industry whatsoever on our site. And uh, 20 years ago, it was a high standing uh, tropical jungle, high canopy forest. Um, so, but, uh, but I'm looking forward to doing more tests. We've got some European scientists who are coming to do a two year study on the impacts that this company is going to have specifically on the soil so I'm I'm allowing that to take place um, by a third party organization yeah cool okay so another uh, termite question can you free range the chickens around your plants to keep the termites from eating all the mulch from Melissa uh, Melissa, where is that? Let me see that. Say it again. Alyssa, could you free range the chickens all around your plants to keep the termites from eating all the mulch? No, because they kick the mulch around so much and the termites work at night as well. Uh, if you go for a walk in the middle of the night, the termites are there. They're a subterranean creature, so they despise sunlight. They actually don't ever want to see sunlight. It kills them. And so even at night, the termites are still working in the mulch. Um, it is a very good system though if you do contain your chickens like within a half acre or a quarter acre lot and you throw in uh, particularly the termites are very attracted to uh, coffee husks because the termites will go in there and infest the entire grounds full of termites and then in the morning when the chickens wake up and they come out of their coop they're eating all those termites in the mulch and scratching it around so but in terms of putting it into the crops it's not it's not really a, not really a good idea uh, because the chickens do actually push the mulch so much that they end up creating all these bare patches uh, throughout your cropland as well. But again, like I said, the environment we're in, we need living mulches to really have a good impact. Awesome. So Fernando had a question. What were the two types of moringa he's using for the animals? Uh, he says, what are the two types he's using for, for the animals and for humans? You know what? I would actually push that over to Neil. Actually, it's a it's a red stem and a green stem. There's the Oleifera uh, N1 or NK1. I, I can't remember the actual letters. And it, basically, it's one and two. Uh, 
Neil, do you know? Uh, if you've got two different species going, probably the one that you're using for superfoods is the Olefera. Um, I'm not down with all the different types of Olefera or all the different selections of Olefera, but um, the red stem, I think, is the Portziana, which is native to... It's native to East Africa, but I don't think it comes from Uganda originally. Uh, that is, that's my best guess. Yeah, that would make sense. So yeah, uh, again, look it up for more clarity as well. Um, yeah, but I know okay. that it's just, it's just a number. The two types are apparently type of oleifera, and they just have like a number. It's like NK1, NK2, something like that. I'm, I'm, I'm probably not getting it right, but it is a one and a two, so there's not really. You know, it's not like Jason and George or whatever. Right. Um, what was I going to say? There are something like 15 different types of Moringa. Uh, yeah. And most of them are native to Africa. There's one that's also native to the Sinai Peninsula, which is the one I'm growing in Saudi Arabia. And there's yeah. one that's native to India. And all the rest are African. Yeah. So there are lots of different types. Yeah, you see them everywhere here. It's a really, you know, traveling around Uganda has been such an amazing adventure in that respect because you learn about a new plant and then suddenly everywhere you go, you start recognizing that plant uh, in various different forms. So, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, really interesting. You've got two other plant questions here. One about do you grow morula for fertility and do you plan on doing ca caliandra? Yeah, so marula, I would love to plant it. I just need to get the seeds, um, but we don't. I don't think we have any right now. Um, we really, really want to get it, actually. Um, Caliandra is all over our land, um, and so we're just waiting for the first trees that we've planted to come to seed, and then we're going to make that one of the primary trees in our nursery. So yes, definitely, Caliandra is, as much as possible, we're trying to establish it everywhere because it's one of those chop and drop crops that we can really, yeah, benefit from. Okay, so I think this might be the last question. Um, well, question and observation. Let's do the observation first is from Silas. According to Alternative Crops for Drylands by Scott O'Barr, Moringa olifera is hardy to USDA Zone 9A. And it will quickly die back to the ground when sub-freezing temperatures occur. All right, yeah. cool. Thanks, Scott, Silas. And... Um, I think last question uh, from Thomas. Yeah, can you introduce rocket stoves to save fuel for wood consumption? Uh, yeah, so we, we built cow dung stoves, which are somewhat modeled after the rocket stoves, um, but they're not, they're not true rocket stoves because a rocket stove, you typically have a ratio of how high up the flame goes first. So, but what we do build is uh, cow dung stoves that encase the fire directly around the pot. Um, and so those are quite efficient with regards to the fuel use. As time goes on and we build up our capacities and we also start getting into the profitability mode, we can introduce any technology that we want which is viable and rocket stoves are definitely one of those. Um, I do have two uh, wood fire steel ovens that work on the rocket stove principles and those are very, very good. Uh, so we're, gonna, we're just about to start utilizing those to make our own bread on a daily basis. And you can fit about four chopped up goats into one. Uh, so it's, they're really, really nice stoves. And we have such amazing fabricators in this country that we can access to build all of these types of things. And there's, there's, there's dozens of different um, stove-based organizations out here, social enterprises that are trying to help people cook better to reduce that, that, uh, that consumption of the, of the firewood. It's a major, it's a major component to the deforestation issue. Yeah. All right, so last question. I've got a couple of questions. I'll, oh, we've got one more from Tomas. Then we'll do mine. Okay, so after getting your PDC, how did you going, go about uh, extended learning and getting practice? Um, yeah, I went straight back to Uganda, which I already had three and a half years of experience in, um, with the direct intentions of building a, a, a the country's largest uh, organic farm. 
uh, franchise company, and so I just I just went headlong straight into it uh, as an adventurer and as a as a <clears throat> you know somebody who's got a got an idea that's bigger than himself. And I really, uh, for the last eleven years, have been living extremely selflessly with regards to how I apply my daily my daily tasks and my monthly objectives and my annual um, you know cornerstones that I try to meet. And uh, <clears throat> getting practice is really just about getting out there and doing it. I mean, there's so many dozens and dozens of different little projects that I've done, even just from backyard gardens with friends and family to you know, helping people with their gutters in their house and teaching people how to manage their farms better, where you just, you pick up that knowledge from getting out there and doing it. And I, I really think it starts with having that attitude of, you know, not being afraid. Don't be afraid to go out and just do something. It doesn't matter how big it is. Do it. You're going to learn from it. Whether you succeed or not is up to what you take away, you know, because I've had a lot of failures as well. You know, I've, I, I tried building. I tried building my first school out of um, out of uh, what do you call it? Uh, like the sandbag, you know, uh, soil bags. And I completely screwed up the foundation, and the whole thing fell apart before I could put the put the roof on it from one big rainstorm. And I thought, well, that was a big waste of time. And then, uh, you know, I learned, and I'm I'm still learning. So yeah, uh, that's I, I think that answers that question. Cool. Uh, Aaron, what do you do? Do you deal with malaria and yellow fever and other infectious diseases? And how does that affect you? Yeah, I've never had yellow fever, but I have had four uh, malaria attacks. Like I've had, I've had malaria four times, and uh, <clears throat> the last one was the worst by far. Um, so. Originally, the first three times was um, during the, you know, obviously the first uh, few years that I was in Uganda. I had once there and then two times when I came back between 2010 and 2016. So within that five-year period, I had it two more times. It was really, really bad. And it would always take me like a month to fully recover from from the the not only the the impact that the the bug had on me, but also the the the, the chemicals that you know you have to take all these pills. Mm -hmm. But the last time that I had it, and again, this is why I'm so adamant about this moringa product. The last time that I had it, it was the worst in in the sense that it really knocked me down super hard. You know, I couldn't get out of bed. I was puking. I was having cold sweats and hot sweats. I was I was drinking like five liters every day, and um, it was just awful. And I finished my regime on the medication, and within the first hour after that regime had gone through my system, and I knew that I was getting on the cure, I started taking my moringa pills again. I didn't want to take them while I was doing the chemicals because I know it's a key later. I didn't want the moringa to absorb the chemicals away from my liver and away from all the other systems that they needed to get into. But I recovered in 24 hours from being on the moringa pills with the selenium. Within 24 hours, I was back up exactly how you're seeing me now, perfectly healthy and ready to go back to work. Whereas the three previous times that I, that I dealt with it, it would take me a month to get my energy back to normal. Um, so definitely, uh, Uganda is is the most dis infectious disease rich in the country uh, in the world. Most infectious disease rich country in the world. Uh, I believe it's still number one. Um, now that largely has to do with the fact that people have poor immune systems because they have poor diets, and also the soils don't have any selenium in them. Very little selenium. And that's that's where this original formula came from. This doctor, this Dr. Harold Foster. Um, was studying the spatial distribution of, of selenium and, and he realized that you know it's not there in, in East Africa it's very very low amounts um, so with the right diet we could if, if, if we get these types of medication this type of food into people's uh, daily daily diets the disease rates will go way down here because people's immune system can fight it off yeah yeah so yeah it's a big it's a big problem but yellow fever I've never had um, I've got I've got an immunization for that, as far as I know, and I, I haven't really heard of anybody having it here. But there are some very random diseases that that do kill people here on a regular basis. Uh, there's, there's people are dying here all the time from disease. 
So yeah, I'm very, very careful, very careful with what I do. Um, I don't sleep under mosquito nets, though. Um, mm. I keep a fan on to blow my smell and blow the mosquitoes away. Uh, that really helps. Uh, I just, I, I don't like these mosquito nets, personally. They're just too much. It, it, it makes me feel like I'm suffocating at night. Yeah, I did the fan thing in Guatemala when I lived in Guatemala. I would have dual fans. Uh... And I never got dengue. Yeah, I like Good. that one. Anyhow, I think I think we're gonna wrap this up, cut the recording, and then we we can stick on and hang out for people that want to do that. But um, Raleigh, you want to say anything before we before we cut out? Yeah, I thought this is a fantastic presentation. There's so much flying to people. This is another like what Mark Shepard says, just a fire hose. I'm sure everyone who attended probably is not going to get everything, but you know, I'll, I'll re-edit this so you'll get the full version of that video, and you'll get Aaron's email, and all that good stuff. And yeah, thanks again for joining us on the Sustainable Design Masterclass. Next week, we have an exciting webinar with uh, the producer of, of the world. I think it's the world's best, most highly awarded olive oil. Um, Nicholas Natin. He's got an olive oil and carob polyculture system in, is it Cyprus? Cyprus. Cyprus, yeah. yeah. So that'll be cool for some of you guys in the drylands who want a, a good model for, for uh, regenerative agriculture there. Good. Um, yeah, I just cool. wanted to say, um, I thought this was fantastic, Aaron. I don't think very many people know your story outside of your immediate circles. Yeah. Um, and I think that the work that you're doing will bring hope to a lot of people who get to know it. So I'm I'm really excited that we can be a platform for you to do that. And uh, and I really hope that we can stay in touch. I'd love I'd love to do some a couple more where we could go into some real detail on some of the stuff you're doing. Absolutely. Um, I think that'd be fantastic to do a series with you and then and then um, package that together. For uh, everybody out there watching us, thank you so much for your time and for your energy and for the feedback you give us. Um, we're hoping to bring on more folks like Aaron who are doing really amazing work and uh, to help everybody else out there to take their own steps wherever you are. So thank you for coming to Sustainable Design Masterclass. Please come to our website and check us out and join our email list and we will keep this uh, fantastic kind of material coming out. Thank you All very right. much. Thanks, everybody. Thank okay. you, guys.